We ready, Amy? Okay. It is 6 p.m. on March 23rd, 2023. I'm going to call this meeting to order and ask um, Council Member Jane Taft to lead us in the flag salute. All right, please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, um, can I have the roll, please? Councilmember Karpinski Costa. Present. Councilmember Lopez Taff. Here. Councilmember Middleton. Here. Vice Mayor Daniels. Here. And Mayor Schaefer. Here. Have the next item, please. This meeting of the Citrus Heights City Council is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the Local Government Affairs Channel, and the Comcast Consolidated Communications and ATT U Verse Cable Systems. This meeting is closed captioned and live streamed at citrusheights.net. Tonight's meeting replay is on Monday, March 27th at 9 a.m. on Channel 14. The meeting can also be viewed at the city's YouTube channel. Great, thank you. So can I have the next item? Oh, approval of the agenda, please. Move approval. Uh, moved by uh, Daniels. Uh, second by? I'll second. Uh, Taff. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? I abstain. Thank you. Measure passes. Next item, please. The next item is public comment. If you wish to address the council during the meeting, please fill out a speaker identification sheet and give it to the city clerk. If participating via Zoom, you may use the raise hand function or star nine from a telephone. And I will unmute you when it is time to speak. Speakers are limited to five minutes each. When your name is called, please step forward to the podium and state your name for the record. Um, and Mayor, you do have some public comment speaker cards from the audience tonight. I also have one written to read. I currently do not see any raised hands on Zoom. Thank you. I will go ahead and take the speaker cards first. And then I'll, once that's done, I'll have you read the, the statement. So. Um, with that, I just wanted to explain to the audience that um, that this is uh, it's not a time a public comment is not a time for council to have a discussion with you. You are absolutely welcome, and we've all been at the at the podium at one point or another. We're a friendly group, and we certainly invite you for any public comments that you have. But again, we're not permitted to uh, to have a discussion with you. So it is quickly. It's, uh, strictly public comment. So with that, may I have Ruth Fox come up and speak. Good evening. My name is Ruth Fox, and I am from Reach and also from Sunrise Ranch Neighborhood Association Area 6. Mayor Schaefer, Council, City Manager Feeney, we are Glad to be here tonight to thank you for your participation in our REACH meeting and our recent potluck. Our neighborhood associations voted um, unanimously to reinstate the REACH potluck after a, vacating it for three years. After Regina Cave so eloquently one night at our meeting said, I think you guys need to reinstate that and have it again and get our community together, and which we did. On May, Monday, March 13th, we had the potluck in which many of you come came. Porsche, we missed you, but we understood and hope and glad you're doing better. But we had participation from all of our neighborhood associations but one. And they brought baskets for us to be able to share on a drawing, to have people to get something special to take home, as well as we had three businesses, Republic Services, Citrus Heights Water District, and Safe Credit Union. And also Green Acres, who was our speaker, brought some special prizes for us to be able to make a drawing and hand out. Our committee that for that evening was Kathy Morris, Margaret Cleek, Donna Mayfield, Diane Louise, Natalie Price, and myself. We had a joyful time 
planning it, trying to get a lot of things uh, for our benefit of our residents. Our speaker that night was Greg Gayton from Green Acres. And after his presentation, he took some time also to answer many of our residents' questions on problems they had in their gardening, in their, um, in their plants, plants that they had in their homes. So again, because you guys took the time to um, sponsor us, we would like to thank you for that time because it would have not been successful without that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ruth. Okay, next up may I have uh, Mike LaFortune with Woodside Homes. Mayor, members of the council, uh, Mike LaFortune with Woodside Homes. We are the project applicant for the Sylvan Corners development. Um, I'm here tonight to reconfirm Woodside's commitment to bring in a high quality project to your city. Uh, Woodside is very much appreciates its relationship with the city and we are very thankful for the collaboration and support staff has been providing through the entitlement process. Uh, we, we share in the frustration of how long feasibility has taken and the entitlement process. Um, but once again, we're here to reconfirm Woodside's commitment. Uh, we very much value and look forward to continuing the relationship with the city. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, so can we have the, uh, the statement that would like to be read? So we received a written comment from Peter Ho, and it states, I spoke to City Council on January 26, 2023, about unjust home receivership of my home. I would like to speak to council and mayors and city leaders again. Um, and that concludes his comment. Thank you very much. With that, I will um, ask for the next item, please. The next item is comments by council members and regional board updates. Okay, with that, can we start with uh, Councilwoman Middleton, please. Ah, yes, thank you. Um, as many of uh, you, my colleagues know, I was not able to attend the spaghetti feed because on Thursday, uh, two weeks ago, I had foot surgery. I'm doing better. I have my trusty steed behind me to get me around, and um, I'm able to chase my children around again, which is exciting because they thought they had the best of me for a little bit there. Um, but I was also able to attend the spaghetti feed that happened this past weekend. I was able to sit with um, Councilmember Karpinski Costa, and we had a really great time, really enjoyed, um, enjoyed that uh, event. And I also want to make sure that I point out that PAL is having their annual Egg Your House um, event. So if you want to know more information, please email PAL. And um, uh, gosh, you have to sign up by April 4th. That's exactly what I was trying to say. You have to sign up by April 4th. Uh, there's a limited number of slots. Um, you can choose from a couple dozen eggs and really support our Police Activities League that does a lot of work with our youth here in the community. I know that they'll be out there egging my house since I can't go hide eggs in my yard and it's super convenient. And I encourage everyone to really get out there and participate. And that concludes my comments. Great, thank you. So uh, Council Member Costa, Gerpinski Costa, if you would lead us off here. Well, mine's gonna take a while because I've been out and about. So yes, I did attend the spaghetti feed and it was nice to share a table with you, Portia. I think our, our band, you know, I want to shout out to our marching band. I think what, I, what impressed me was they have a nine-year-old playing the drums. Is it nine? I think it was nine. And a 92-year-old back there, I couldn't see what instrument he was playing, but you don't have to, it doesn't matter what age you are, you could be part of the community marching band. You don't have to own an instrument because they have plenty to, to let you use and ha own practically while you're there. You don't even have to read music. You don't have to have played an instrument in the last 50 years, some of them. And so it's just, it, it's a true community marching band. And so, you know, kudos to Kathy Cook who started it. And it was just, uh, I was, it just always hits my heart, this marching band. So I was glad to be there. Um, Portia, you forgot to mention that we both went to the Masonic Temple. Didn't we both do Masonic? Oh, no, it was Mary Jane. Okay, so we went to the Masonic Lodge and met with the Masons. Their, their community, you know, everybody thinks they're a little secret society down on San Juan, and what is that building? Um, they want to participate in the community. They're going to have an event, um, Strawberry Festival in June, a, a yard sale on the front of their property. The Masons are really an interesting group because they... 
they are real community oriented, kind of like uh, the, uh, the Rotary. You know, it's kind of reminded me of the Rotary, they, although they may have some secret handshakes or whatever. But they, they're, uh, Mr. Duffy, I think, had plans to come to our next council meeting during public comment and explain a little bit more of the Masons. And so I kind of, they do, they support public schools, which I think a partnership with them is nice. Um, so I went to that. Uh, I went to our Assemblyman Hoover and Senator Nilo had a community meeting, well attended. They had to pull more chairs out because these, this room was full. And I recommend, you know, when they have another public community meeting to attend because they were answering questions. Uh, they talked about the bills that are pending that they support. And so um, they also have available, which I thought was cool, a veteran's resource book. So if you know a veteran, are a veteran, this book is so full of resources that, that there's something for everybody that needs it. So if you're a neighborhood association, if you get a couple of these and have them available to your members, um, they're through CalVet, C-A-L-V-E-T. I went to the Reach Potluck. I did that, that was fun. I won the door prize from Republic which was an echo. I don't know how to use it yet because I'm, I'm challenged, but I want it. Um, I have to download an app. Um, I see what else I do. I went on a tour of Echo, the Echo Project. Now, this is something that I hope you, if you all want to take a tour of the wastewater treatment plant, it's worthwhile. It's incredible. You'll be overwhelmed. Let me see what I hear. It's the regional sand sewer treatment plant. So it's all of the, when you flush your little toilet, it's all the water that comes from the entire region ends up at this one little spigot coming in. And they, they are permitted to treat 181 million gallons a day. That's how much water flows in. And then they treat the water. I, I asked, it takes about four and a half hours for the, for the little piece of water to go through all the various pipes and things that it happens, the primary cleaning out, and then all of this. It's incredible place. I mean, it's just incredible. It's hard to describe. But what's interesting, they, have, well, they have the effluent that kind of comes out, and that water is, is cleaner than the Sacramento River. So they dump that water into the Sacramento River. But they also regenerate with biomass. They take out the solids, and it goes into a, a treatment building or whatever pipes, whatever, heat it up, and then they make fertilizer out of the biomass. Then they also have biogas that treats the methane. They sell the methane to SMUD, and SMUD uses it for, uh, 50, what is it, 5,800 homes for one year. SMUD can supply electricity based on the, the methane that they buy from the sac sewer plant. It, it's an incredible place. Uh, in May, they have a... Um, Buffer lands, uh, they, is the, they buffer their plant from all the neighbors with this huge 2,600 acres of wildlife and animals and birds. and It's incredibly beautiful. And they have a walk on the wild side. We May 20th. Great thing to take your children to, to educate them about nature. So it's, it's a wonderful place. If you, <laughs> I like this one. So what happens after you flush, you can go to regional san, all one word, dot com slash tour and sign up to take a tour. Big groups, small groups, they put you on a bus, drive you around because it is a big joint, big place. Anyway, so it was really great. And then we had a mosquito meeting this morning. Uh, I wanted you to know that with all this rain, you can expect mosquitoes this year. They're not so bad right now because we haven't had enough warm weather for them to start laying their eggs and hatching. But you can expect we will have mosquitoes. Do not hesitate to call the district uh, if you are bothered by them, because we'll definitely come out and treat whatever we can. Uh, the day biters, we're still interested if you get bitten during the day, because their usual mosquitoes are at dawn and dusk. The really bad ones are the ones that bite you during the day that can grow in a bottle cap. So with all this rain, when it finally ends, be sure to get out in the yard. Even a bottle cap of water can, can be a place where these mosquitoes will, will hatch. And it's, it's, it's just scary what can happen. So 
I'll remind you, and I think Gary's coming in April to do a presentation on the district during Mosquito Appreciation Week. Or <laughs> appreciation, you know, week. Um, dead birds are gonna start, if you find dead birds, we're gonna start opening up our dead bird hotline for you to call the district and we'll come and get your dead bird. Now they're saying do not pick up the dead birds because you might get bird flu. So be sure to, you know, there's a, there's a web, there's a link on our website at fightthebite.net that shows you how to handle a dead bird. So you can flip on that. It's I think of the YouTube that comes from the California Department of Public Health and you can watch that. And then lastly, I think it's lastly, I don't know, I've been so busy. I was principal of the day, principal for a day, and I was, went to um, Arlington Heights Elementary School. And what an education I got. So uh, I learned a lot. I mean, they are a TK, which is pre-kindergarten, it's TK, they're tiny little guys, to fifth grade. And the principal there, Rafael Martinez, is probably, he's like a school version of our city manager. You know, he's kind of a go-getter, good visions, and he's just, I was just very pleasurable to be with this guy. And I got to see the classrooms and the teachers and how a good school is run. It is a Title I school. Title I schools are the ones that have uh, low income, a lot of low income enrollment, and so they get extra money from the federal government to apply to the children. But his school, he, he okay, they got, after COVID, all the schools got ELO funds. See, this is something we just don't ever hear about. ELO funds stand for Expanded Learning Opportunities, and it's good for three years, and it supposedly helps kids get over the, the, the seclusion of COVID when they stayed home. So some of them have emotional issues, and they have animals, uh, stuffed animals in the classrooms for them. And, and to see the different needs of the children and, and how the ELO funds are used for extra instructors, extra teachers to give more one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, his school, he's so proud, does better than all the San Juan schools of his TK to five, but not as high as the national average. But he's working on it, and, it, and it's incredible. He also does, which I was impressed with, he's the only elementary school in San Juan, I do believe, system that has Project Lead the Way. And what it is, is these, and Carnegie is the next step up after you go to this school. So you start with these characters, three characters, and when you're in the little TK, when you're in the first grade, you solve problems, these characters, every year, your three characters are with you and you solve the problem again. To the point where, at one point, they, they help a, a lion who escaped a cub from its mom in the zoo to get back in, and they, they create physical ways to move that cage into the cage. It's really incredible, and if you go to Carnegie, they become bigger, and they have robots, and they do, they, they really learn a lot following these three characters with the various challenges they have to solve along the way. It's a great program. Uh, they have 413 kids at this school, and it was, I, I'm just so impressed at this school, and um, I'm gonna bring some of my duck eggs over there in an incubator, and they're gonna incubate some ducks. And, uh, but the problem was he has 10% no-shows for kids in the morning. So there's 40 kids that aren't showing up at school that are, that are registered. So he said parents are not, parents are part of the problem. So when we look at our school issues, we have to consider it's not all the district as much as it is sometimes just the parents. Anyways, this was, the, he was a great guy, had a great time. What else did I do? I think that's it for now. I thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was a very uh, I've elaborate been busy. report. I've been very, maybe I get my laundry done this week. All right. So, uh, Councilwoman Jane Taff, would you care to share us what you with what you've been up to? Absolutely. It has really been a busy two weeks. Uh, I will be brief. Uh, on the tenth, I attended the Homeless Policy Council meeting for the region. Very interesting to hear about what what the region is doing as far as addressing homelessness in our unhoused population. Uh, it was the first meeting of this group for the year, so stay tuned. I also attended the San Juan Unified School District Innovation School meeting at Cambridge Heights on the same night, the 10th, 
And that was really informative, very interesting what the, uh, the process that they're engaging in. It's really a community process where they brought a facilitator on and, and um, they're asking, what are the challenges? How can we address them better, more effectively? And so really this was the first blush of the conversation, including the community, the parents, and the students as well. So that was very informative for me to see what the, uh, the school district is doing within our schools. I also attended, as, as uh, uh, Dr. Jaina mentioned, the Masonic Lodge Open House. Again, very interesting. The REACH pro, uh, potluck as well. I also attended on the 14th the Chamber Luncheon with the updates from Congressman Ami Bera. Very, very good updates he gave both locally and federally. It's always good to have that perspective. And, um, uh, Congressman Barra is also very open to all of us. He's very friendly with Citrus Heights community. Uh, I see him around town a lot, so um, I really do enjoy meeting meeting with our Congress congressman. I also attended, just because this is the season, um, a legislative briefing from our Cal Cities organization. I think I think we we I have underestimated the the. Uh, the joy that our legislators get from presenting bills. <laughs> we, this year we had a record breaking 2,300 plus bills proposed in the first few weeks of um, them being open. And I just think, wow, how are we going to get through all these and how, how can we filter them down to the useful, the understandable, and so I know uh, my colleagues and I are very, very interested in keeping on top of those that will affect our city. I attended just today the library board meeting. A nice interesting tidbit is that they recently installed a tele telehealth booth at Valley High North Laguna Library. And this is really interesting to me. And this is so that individuals who do not otherwise have a private space or online access, that they could have, um, space to meet with their health providers online. And I thought that was a very thoughtful, innovative way for our libraries to be useful to, to our citizens. And that's my report. Thank you, Jane. So Vice Mayor Daniels, what have you been up to? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, joined uh, some of my other council members at the REACH Potluck. Um, what a great event. And man, the food was amazing. Um, put that on your calendar next year. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a fun time. Uh, we won two uh, raffle prizes, uh, so it was even more fun for the kid. And uh, I would recommend you put it on your calendar for next year because uh, good time and good food. Um, let me see. Today the Air Board met, and uh, not a whole lot out, out of that, except I uh, wanted to share that uh, we're finally getting delivery, I believe it is, of the 16 Tesla electric heavy-duty trucks. Um, amazing. Um, vehicles that uh, you'll see on the road in the Sacramento area um, that uh, can deliver your Pepsi products, which are always better than Coke, but um, uh, uh, look for those and uh, amazing little things. Today, today was garbage day and the uh, garbage guy said the Republic is providing them electric trucks. Nice. He's Very getting nice. an electric truck. So garbage will be quiet now when they go. <laughs> Also along RT, um, I did have a meeting, uh, I don't know, about a week ago with the, um, on the SAC RT ad hoc board composition and voting, whatever, whatever. Um, and basically out of that, um, we are finalizing uh, the, the, um, the, d the delivery of the system of how we vote on the RT board. And those kind of things have gone through different phases with other boards like STA, SACOG, whatever, where you either have weighted voting or you have just, uh, you know, a single vote. And, um, uh, you know, to me, the only real fair vote is a weighted vote when you talk about a regional board, but that wasn't the consensus. And uh, so I think out of that, what we're going to end up seeing is uh, an extra vote for Elk Grove and an extra vote for the County Board of Supervisors who currently only get four votes on that, that board. Uh, we'll continue to have one vote along with other, the other smaller cities, but Elk Grove will increase to two votes based on their population. 
There is a uh, service disruption planned for station modifications on the gold line this coming weekend. Uh, that's basically a downtown midtown kind of thing, but in case you use that uh, to get around down there, wanted to be sure and share that. Um, coming up uh, on March 29th at 7 p.m. at Rush Park, uh, we'll have the opening ceremonies for the the Wall That Heals, uh, that is a uh, replica of the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. that is there to honor American heroes who lost their lives during the Vietnam War. A uh, replica, it will come to uh, Rush Park. Um, there'll be events from that point on through for several days, mostly in the evening. And then um, on Sunday, April 2nd at 1.30 p.m., we'll have the closing ceremonies there. So. Um, I, I, I want to suggest everybody go there and um, take your kids so your kids understand uh, what we went through. Um, and then the final thing will be Easter is April 9th. Uh, remember, he is the reason for the season. And uh, go get some Jesus. That's it. Well, thank you, Vice Mayor. So I've also had a busy week. I want to go ahead and start with uh, I had... Uh, so the, those who are not aware, there's a SACOG, which is a Sacrament Area Council of Governments. Um, I couldn't have been more proud of our staff. Uh, and Amy, would you, uh, if you would um, uh, put up the slide that I requested. And what's impressive about this is that uh, these are projects that, the, that our staff submitted to SACOG for, um, for, their, for a vote. Uh, and that they're all rated on the average score. You can see the citrusites in the first one Ooh. is second, um, and that's $7.1 million for, uh, for Arcade Cripple Creek Extension. And uh, with that, I, like I said, I just I, um, staff does not get praised enough for their hard work and the reason they scored high. There were... Uh, several other projects, if you look at the, the uh, ATP ranked contingency list, those are the unsuccessful uh, projects. Oh. So you really needed to rank higher than 76 in order to, to uh, qualify. And, um, and it was a, it's a very competitive process, and we did extremely well. Um, and I take that back because this is, a, I think, the second. Is that green means go on the bottom? No. Anyway. So uh, the bottom line is, so on the cripple, uh, Arcade Cripple Creek, uh, I just want to recognize Leslie Bloomquist, uh, Rachel Muldoon, uh, Mary Poole, Eric Singer, and Casey Campanar. Thank you very much for your hard work. It's going to be a great project. Um, and then uh, do you have another slide for the Green Means Go, or is that the bottom one here? I, I really can't tell. So, like, Auburn, that, that, that's it right there. Okay. So um, you look at the, that bottom table there. So we didn't actually get the slide that shows the unsuccessful projects. Oh, okay. Uh, but that's what I wanted to compare. I'm like, look, this, these are the ones that were successful. N that's not to say it take away that, um, that our staff was, is very, very competent and competitive when it comes to that. So, so again, it, I want to thank. Is the old Auburn funded or is that? I, old Auburn got funded, yes. I, I can... Uh, oh, wait a second. I can help uh, No, the, the Old Auburn did not get funded. Uh, I'm talking about the 350000 that I don't see on here for the... Is that a next slide? No? Um, I can just mention on this bottom table, Mr. Okay, Mayor. Sure. Thank you for your comments about our staff that worked so yeah. hard on this, too. Uh, thank you for the recognition. And yeah. uh, ranking second highest in the region out of all submissions for the RK Cripple Creek extension was definitely a uh, tremendous... Um, accomplishment and uh, and recognition too from uh, from SACOG. What this bottom table here is showing is uh, these are the contingency list, and then there's a whole other list that didn't make it beyond this. So uh, for Old Auburn Road complete streets, we're only two points out, uh, you know, from making it. So we're going to continue to meet with SACOG and see what we can do to try and be more competitive for the next round on that. Um, so what are the points based on? What do they base it on? They base it on criteria that's part of the application submittal. Uh, and so there's different points that you rank and score on. So uh, uh, that, but the green means go that you're speaking to. Right. That was uh, another grant that SACOG funded through the green means go program. And so, uh, you know, we were one of uh, the limited district uh, 
jurisdictions that receive the grant funding for Green Means Go, and that is for the uh, Sunrise Tomorrow um, next phase of kind of infrastructure planning uh, that will kind of build on the good work that the council's already done. So, uh, you know, it's a couple great awards there. Thanks for thanks for highlighting. Absolutely, it, it was it was a, a pleasure to be there and to to, to listen to. Uh, it was a unanimous vote on both points. Uh, you have 31 board directors there, and everybody, uh, it was 100% unanimous. So that's not always the case. So even though there was a little bit of, um, you know, uh, complaint that some of the people didn't get the money that they expected they were going to get, um, I'm delighted to say because of our hard work of our staff that we did do very, very well. So uh, with that, um, I also attended uh, Senator Nilo and Josh, uh, Josh Hoover's um, uh, open house that they had here in this room. Uh, it was extremely well attended. I got the pleasure of meeting uh, some of our, our community members here. Um, and we really are focused on, uh, we, there was a lot of discussion there about uh, our homeless issue and how we're going to get those get those issues addressed. So um, that was uh, just a, a great uh, a great meeting, and I'm glad that uh, that we had a great turnout for that. I also attended the Reach Potluck, which again, uh, mutually, uh, thank you so much for uh, for the Reach team for putting that together. It was a great event. Really enjoyed it. I did was fortunate enough to win one of the raffle tickets, uh, one of the raffles. My wife is delighted of the. Um, of the, uh, there were not lilies, the orchids. There were orchids. So. Oh, you got Sorry, I'm a brown thumb guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I could, you can't tell a lily from an orchid. So, <laughs> anyhow, so, <laughs> all right. So, and I'm so disappointed that I was, I had to miss the, um, the Citrus Heights marching band, um, uh, spaghetti feed. I understand it was a great success, but, uh, but I, I, and unfortunately, I also am also previously committed on the the opening ceremonies for the wall that heals. Um, I'm really disappointed and sad that I have to miss that, but I will be there for the closing ceremony. So, uh, with that, um, that's all I really had. So, can we have the next item, please? The next item is consent calendar items four and five. Okay, so I'd like to pull item four. Um, and uh, can we go ahead and can I have I'll a move item five. Second. Move item five. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Motion by uh, Karpinski Casa, second by uh, Portia Middle by Councilwoman Middleton. Aye. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Hearing none. Motion passes. So I'm going to uh, talk about item four. Uh, I missed the March 9th meeting, so I have to abstain for that one. I was here for the March 3rd. So uh, with that, uh, anybody else uh, have any concerns about? No, I have to abstain from the March 9th one okay. as so, well. So uh, can we, um, uh, understanding that, can we have a, um, a motion for item four? Move to approve. Second. Okay, approval by, um, move to approve by TAF. Uh, um, second by Daniels. All those in favor? Aye. Our motion passes. Next item, please. Next item is public hearing, item number six. The subject is Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for Program Year 2022 Community Development Block Grant Funds. The recommendation is to adopt a resolution approving the Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report for Program Year 2022 and direct staff to submit with minor modifications as necessary uh, the CAPER report to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, Nicole Piva with the um, Community Development Department. So I am here tonight. Um, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to hold a public hearing to consider the adoption of the Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report, otherwise known as the CAPER, and to direct staff to submit the CAPER to HUD. So what is a CAPER? Um, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development requires the city, which we're a recipient of community development block funds, 
to submit a um, annual report to HUD, which outlines all of our CDBG funded activities throughout the program year. As part of citizen participation process, a public notice was published in the Citrus Heights Messenger announcing the availability of the draft caper. The report's been made available to various public areas, including the housing's web, housing webpage for a 15-day public comment and public review period. The city welcomes any uh, public participation throughout the program year, and to date, we have not received any public comment, but if we do, we will include it in the final report that is due March 31st. In 2022, the city received um, $624,000 in CDBG entitlement funds. These funds allow the city to carry out a number of housing activities that target primarily low-income households. The city also received some program income in 2022. Um, this varies every year. These are receipts um, from previous CDBG funded loans that the city receives and we filter those uh, loan repayments back into the city's home repair loan program. In addition, uh, we also received some community, community support funds that was rewarded to some of the nonprofits to provide um, services. So this table shows the CDBG funds that we expended during the program year and the activities that we were able to complete. The city used CDBG funds in partnership with the city's general services department to help implement two of the capital improvement projects. The first one being the residential street resurfacing project. This project provided 29 accessible curb ramps and six sidewalks were repaired and brought into compliance. The Greenback Complete Streets project provided accessibility and public infrastructure improvements and upgrades to signalized intersection and ADA compliant curb ramps and crosswalks. In addition, the city provided various services to low income residents, including the Sayonara after school program, the emergency food closet that provided food and household supplies to, to low income households, senior meals, housing counseling, a navigator program for people who are experiencing homelessness, and a tenant landlord fair housing program along with the home repair loan program. This table is our CV funds. These are the activities we were able to provide with those funds and the amount that was spent during the year. In March of 2022, the city received a total of $920,000 in coronavirus funds, other known as CV funds, um, from HUD to respond to the impacts of COVID-19. As of October to 2021, all of our CV funds have been fully allocated and we're on track to spend the total award amount by the expenditure deadline. So in 2022, we're able to continue to utilize these funds to prevent, prepare, and respond to the coronavirus through various activities, including the food closet, distri distribution at the Sunrise Christian Food Ministry, meals to seniors, a workforce development program, a landlord fair housing counseling program, a critical repair grant program, and the supplemental navigator program. All of these funds are used to provide services to our low-income residents. I'm just going to highlight a couple of our nonprofits that provided services, uh, one being the Sayonara Center. Uh, the center has been very busy. They provided after school, after school tutoring services to over 100 kids in the Sayonara area. Um, not only do they provide the after school program, but they also provide a lot of fun activities, including community parties with food, games, and inflatables. A reunion was held for all the current students and past students who have graduated high school. The center has been serving first through 12th grade students since 2015. The majority of the students have graduated and they still stay in contact with the center and drop by from time to time. During the summer, 30 students attended summer camp and elementary students were able to participate in swim lessons and activities at the park. Also, they held their first golf clinic. Um, students received lessons 
and our Citrus Heights Police Department joined the event as well. In addition, um, the photograph on the right, it shows um, these were, this was our food closet that they offered to families who were impacted by the um, COVID-19. They were able to come to the center and um, pick up any food or supplies that they needed. Another program to highlight, um, I'm just gonna talk real briefly about this, um, but I just wanted to let you know in May, Sergeant Cimino and the Citrus Heights Navigator, Gabriella Roth, they're gonna present um, a detailed presentation on this program and let you know all the exciting things that they offer and highlight some of their stories. Um, but the, the Housing Counseling Navigator Program, we contract with Sacramento Self-Help Housing and those, um, that program is funded with our CDBG and our PLHA funds. And the second part of this program, the 313,000 was allocated to this fund. These were our CV funds, and it has provided 65 households to date with housing and essential services. So we have about $48,000 remaining, and uh, clients have stayed at the Ranch Motel, Grace House, Auburn Oaks, and they've received other assistance with first month's rent and deposit. The Critical Repair Grant Program, <clears throat> these are repairs that have actually happened, um, new roof, windows, and HVAC. In 2022, this program was awarded $96,000 of our CV funds. These are grants up to $20,000 offered to qualified homeowners to make essential repairs. And in 2022, we provided six projects. And last, the home repair program. These are loans up to $60,000 offered to eligible homeowners for safety, health and safety repairs and a variety of services um, are offered as well, same as the critical repair grant program, new windows, HVAC. Um, we were able to replace a shower tub and a new roof, and we were able to provide six projects with these funds. So with that, i like to make a recommendation to hold a public hearing and then to have council adopt the caper. Great. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, any uh, questions from council members? Or? Yeah, I do have one. One of your slides, it said on the slide 4,800, you spoke 48,000. Is it 48,000 unspent or 4,800? 4,800 remaining. Okay, you spoke different. That's okay. That's okay. I heard different. Okay. Okay. And no other questions? Um, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing. And uh, please come up and speak if you have uh, any questions or concerns on this item. Um, do we have anybody on Zoom? I do have one individual on Zoom that has a raised hand. Great. So I'll go ahead um, and allow them to speak. Rick Hodgkins, you can now unmute yourself to speak. Yes, um, excuse me, I'm blind. My, I am blind because so my computer talks. Excuse me, uh, I'm blind so my computer talks. So sorry about that. Uh, Rick Hodgkins from eight from Arborell Apartment Homes, 8007 Sunrise Boulevard, Apartment 179. Um, I don't know if that's in Area 6 or 10, but that this reminds me of the fact that our apartment complex was just previously bought by Security Properties Residential SPR out of the Seattle Tacoma uh, metropolitan region of the state of Washington. And that we too have an on site program in our community center on that's doing stuff like that, not just for kids, but um, but uh, we're also seeking uh, ways in that which to improve our community. Uh, so anything that the city can do for us is also appreciative. So thank you very much. Thank you. 
Any other public comment? No raised hands. Okay. I have no other. I have no other raised hand. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. Any additional questions or comments from council? It's a lot of work. I will say that thank you for the presentation, Nicole. It looks like you had to count the heads that were served and it's kind of a lot of, a lot of paperwork. Great. Thank you. May I have a motion? Move staff's recommendation. Second. Okay. Motion by Daniels, second by Middleton. Uh, do you want to do a, uh, do you want to do a roll call or just all in one? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Seeing none, measure passes. Okay, next item, please. The next item is regular calendar, item number seven. The subject is consideration of forming a Citrus Heights Education Committee, and the recommendation is to, for the City Council to discuss and provide description direction on the formation of a Citrus Heights Education Committee. And good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Just bear with me for a moment. I have a brief uh, PowerPoint presentation to share with the City Council on this item. So at the January 12th City Council meeting, uh, during items requested by Council Members, Council discussed a future agenda item to consider forming a Citrus Heights Education Committee to examine the feasibility of a Citrus Heights School District. Tonight, staff is presenting some items for the Council's consideration. To assist in your deliberations in the staff report, staff included information on types of advisory committees that the city has formed in the past. And as you can see here, the first examples are Law Enforcement Citizens Advisory Committee that was established to review long-term service delivery options prior to forming our police department. The committee was comprised of 21 council appointed members. The city did retain a consultant to assist with facilitating the meetings in the committee work plan. The committee met twice a month for approximately five months. And then we also have here the Animal Care and Regulations uh, Citizens Advisory Committee that was very similar to the Law Enforcement Committee. The previous advisory committees serve as a good model to use in consideration of forming a committee's work plan and time frame. This clear work plan would allow the committee to complete spe specific tasks desired by the city council and then report back to the council with their findings and any further recommendations. The council could identify the work plan and time frame this evening during your deliberations or consider assigning this task to one of the city council two by two ad hoc committees such as our education and community programs or the quality of life committee or consider creating a new council ad hoc committee to discuss this specific task. Then the committee would review the work plan and it would be brought back to the city council for future discussion and consideration. The fiscal impact of forming a committee would involve some staff time. The city would seek to utilize a consultant to assist with the facilitation of the committee, similar to what was done with the law enforcement uh, committee. And depending on the work plan that is adopted by the city council, there may be additional consultant and legal cost as part of the future actions associated with the committee's policy recommendations to the City Council. Therefore, some items tonight for the Council's consider our consideration are whether to form a Citrus Heights Education Committee, and if you determine to form the committee, the composition and selection process, as well as the proposed work plan and time frame, or alternatively, provide uh, alternate direction to staff. And lastly, we have prepared, that was in the staff report, some next steps if the council chooses to move forward with a committee. The application would open in June. We would have an application period, then send those to council for review in July. And depending on the work plan that is prescribed by council, 
somewhere in August to early February 2024, the committee would meet and then present their findings to the city council. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I have this slide up here for the council's consideration. Great. Questions from council? Okay, seeing none. Um, so, uh, let's see here. All right, so. Um, and Mayor, I, I do have one raised hand on Zoom, and I do okay. know that we had a couple of speakers. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask for public comment. Uh, so let's hear the Zoom comment first, please. And John, you can now unmute yourself to speak. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I'm out of town and I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I wanted to express uh, our support for our city to begin researching uh, what's involved in forming our own school district. Um, honorable council members, our children are our future. Our children's future, attending school safely and receiving a sound academic education is a vital part of that future. And this is why I wanted to just quickly address the council on two critical concerns I have and other parents regarding uh, the public schools in our city. The first is our children's safety while in school. There have been 156 school shootings in the US since 2018. I was shocked, I didn't know it was that many. 156 in less than five years, that's a little over 31 per year, and that's over two per month. And yet, because of a lack of fencing and other safety measures, anyone can literally walk into classrooms in many of our city's schools. Now, council members, just yesterday, March 22nd, two school administrators were seriously wounded and shot by an armed student in Colorado. So safety, how long before we experience something so horrific and tragic? Academic rigor. Right now, as you probably know, Los Angeles Unified School District employees and teachers are on strike. Do you know that they are demanding a 30% pay increase? 30% in one of the academically worst districts in the country. And meanwhile, 420,000 students, according to a news source I looked at today, cannot attend schools, making them fall even further behind academically after having no in-person instruction for well over a year during COVID. Academic rigor. California schools have the lowest math and reading standings in the country including including our schools in Citrus Heights. Ask parents, why do they go to other schools? Why do they go to other districts? Now, at a recent council meeting, the wonderful Kathy Morris spoke on this issue. In her comments, she suggested that we should give the San Juan School Board with its two new members from our area time to address the concerns in our schools. I want you to know, Council, I couldn't agree more with Mrs. Morris. She had sound and wise input. Tanya Kravchuk is terrific. I've met her, I've talked with her, I've heard her speak, I even helped with her election campaign. And it's my understanding that Steve Miller ran for the board, he won, because of his desire to help the schools in our city. So I agree with Kathy, give the new San Juan School Board a chance. But question, does a city wait for a fire before it researches the cost and logistics of getting a fire engine? If we know there's a potential, a very real risk of fire, 
Do we wait until there's a fire or do we begin researching and gathering information now so that we can address the risk of the fire before it happens? Having an education committee doesn't mean the city staff has to be involved. I was just corrected by the clerk's presentation. But I want you to know I want to volunteer, and I know at least three parents that are willing to volunteer freely to serve on this committee. I'm friends with the superintendent of a school district in San Joaquin County, and I have firsthand knowledge that breaking away from the San Juan School District will not be a simple matter. There's legal requirements, there's statutes, there's all kinds of hurdles. But if it turns out that San Juan does not or is not able to adequately address the very real safety concerns and academic record of our schools, then we have the information in place to consider options at that time. I thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, and with the next, I may have Al Fox uh, come in terms of the podium and speak. Good evening, council members. My name is Al Fox. I'm a member of a local nonprofit, a resident of Citrus Heights, and I was the director of an outreach program over two and a half years through COVID that reached out to all 12 schools in Citrus Heights. Through COVID, I served the schools, the staff, and the students, and I saw firsthand the needs and the impact that a community can have reaching out to those schools. I was privileged to be principal for a day for a K-8 campus in Citrus Heights, and I saw firsthand the struggles facing students, teachers, and staff as they work to gain back educational foundations lost because of the state mandated school closures. For the past 10 to 12 years, Citrus Heights has expressed our disappointments with the direction and leadership of the San Juan Unified School District. I was one of those who was part of that, as many of you know. And I was the lack of uh, school board representation, those who would truly be interested in the needs of our students as priorities. One former board member who by his own admission, had not visited a Citrus Heights school mm. in the past five years, had not even been on a campus. Some of the others would not say so directly, but did implicate that they had not even been on the campuses. As a community, we fought for and by final vote of the Sacramento County Board of Education, we received authorization for a public charter school in Citrus Heights, and that school is growing year by year. COVID caused a close down with, not a close down, but a slow down with their progress, but it is there. It's an alternative that we're seeing. In the last two years, we have had the addition of school board district trustee that is solely Citrus Heights. That would be Steve Miller, as the previous um, speaker mentioned. Two of our schools have two board, have a second board of trustee, as he mentioned, who is newly elected and is a strong advocate for our schools. Our current trustee has found new support one other, excuse me, one other trustee has found new support as he's been a longer member of the board. And through that, we have a strength to join in greater efforts for our school improvements. We as voters in Citrus Heights have had our voices heard, and we have initiated change in school improvements. This exploratory effort is starting our own district, I think is ill-timed if we go to the consultant and to the expense of going to that end at this point. It's counterproductive. Let's give this new board and superintendent the opportunity to make the changes and improvements that we have fought for and that we have needed to improve our schools and create opportunities for greater student learning outcomes. We finally have choices on the district board. We have voices on the district board. Let's give them the support they need to create the change we envision. We have the potential of seeing firsthand the strengths and pitfalls of starting a new district by the planned efforts of Rancho Cordova who, if they decide to continue, will separate from Folsom Cordova District structure. Let's give that effort a chance and see what those pitfalls are and what difficulties they're going to face. They have a larger population. They have a larger future population growth. They have a larger budget income to support such a change. I urge you to at least postpone this effort for at least two years and give the San Juan Unified School District Superintendent and Board a chance to develop their plans for Citrus Heights. Just watch the changes underway at Mesa Verde, or if not to delay it, if to not delay it, at least vote against doing it at this time. I would also refer to some notes that I made earlier this evening. 
Some of the reasons to not form a district, one, it would not be a district under the control of the city. It would be a separate district like the park district. Two, we would be one of the smallest, poorest districts in California with a lot of low income and English second language learners, which creates its own problem for our schools. As I well found out when I was my principal for a daytime, talking with the uh, principal and the staff. And three, the state prefers unification, not small districts. SCOA or the State um, Board of Education probably would not approve such an effort on our behalf without a great deal of legal battle by us. And there's no enrollment growth predicted in Citrus Heights for several years. The gentleman who spoke earlier also mentioned about the fact that we need fencing. They have already allotted $10 million in security fencing for schools in the district, including those in Citrus Heights, and those plans are underway. So I urge you tonight, Rather than voting on this and going ahead with the expenses involved in creating a committee, either do, as someone proposed, an alternative uh, action with staff and a two-by-two two with the uh, council, or vote this particular matter down at this point in time, postpone it for two years, and let's see what happens as the other districts start making moves and see if we can't afford to do it. Thank you. All right, may I have uh, Tom Sheeler to the podium, please. Mayor, council members, Tom Sheeler, a 40 year resident of Citrus Heights. Um, Citrus Heights school performance has always sort of been an issue within Citrus Heights. Um, our children did not go to school in Citrus Heights for that reason. And um, I think it would be great to at least explore the opportunity for forming our own school district. But as, as, as uh, Council Member Karpisinkoska said, um, there are many other issues, and sort of referenced by Mr. Fox, uh, there are many other issues that affect students that also then affect school performance. And I think that, we, that must be understood in terms of what we expect if we were to form our own district, what we would expect. There are issues that need to be addressed um, in terms of uh, parental involvement, as mentioned by Mr. Mr. Daniels, home life issues and school safety. All these affect school, uh, student performance. Um, I started my engineering career working in West Sacramento in 1978. Uh, West Sacramento incorporated in 1987 and became an actual city. Uh, the, the first mayor, well, actually not the first mayor, but Mr. Mayor Cobaldon, who was mayor for a, quite a long time and very much an advocate of education, uh, saw the underperforming or the, the schools needing additional performance. And so he started a very aggressive initiative of bringing up the performance of the schools. And that was done because they had a school district within their city boundary. They had what you know we all call local control. Now I understand Mr. Fox's point about that is not necessarily a, de a department of the city. I understand that. But we would be unto ourselves as opposed to being put into the pot with all of San Juan School District schools. So um, in 19, uh, to sort of, sort of show the benefit of some, that something like that may have, in 2014, West Sacramento was named the most livable city in the United States for cities under 10,000 po population by the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Now, the, admittedly, West Sacramento is not such a site in terms of land availability and development opportunities and whatever else. There are many factors that go into that. I understand that. But that does show one of the benefits of having a strong school system that that really benefits all the members and attracts new families seeking or that are comfortable with that. Um, you know, we are a land constrained, and so improving our quality of life is crucial to the vibrancy and growth of Citrus Heights. So I hope you seriously consider it. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have uh, Daniel Thigpen with San Juan Unified School District uh, come to the podium, please? Hi, good evening, <clears throat> excuse me, Mayor, Council members and staff. My name is Daniel Thigpen and I'm here on behalf of the Superintendent's Office at the San Juan Unified School District. First, I wanna thank the Council for leading this important dialogue tonight. Having city leaders who are actively engaged in the success of our schools and who want what's best for our students and families is critical to student achievement. 
San Juan Unified is proud of the long-standing partnerships we have in Citrus Heights to support student and community success. For instance, thriving community partnerships have helped us expand access to high quality academic opportunities, including before, after, and summer school options for local youth that keep students engaged and enriched beyond the traditional school day. Our voters too here are key partners and continually supported bond measures that have allowed us to invest close to $160 million since 2002 to modernize classrooms and build new athletic facilities in Citrus Heights schools. So that's another major benefit of being a unified school district, having the flexibility to maximize all available resources in ways that directly target and support Citrus Heights schools. For example, as the council heard earlier this year, the district is setting aside millions of dollars to review, improve, and enhance safety measures throughout all of its schools, including those here in Citrus Heights. Ms. Karpinski koska thank you for being a principal for a day this week, and you mentioned Title I dollars earlier. So it's also worth sharing that San Juan Unified recently changed how it allocates those federal funds it receives to support academic achievement in schools where there is the highest need. And so as a result, beginning next year, we'll be steering an additional $400,000 annually to Mesa Verde High School, resources that can be used to hire and train teachers and staff, support and enhance successful programs, and expand learning opportunities for students. We know those opportunities for academic success mean rethinking and restructuring what learning environments look like to better meet the needs of Citrus Heights students. Uh, Ms. Lopez staff, thank you for attending the Cambridge Heights Innovative Schools uh, Community Engagement Session. Um, that's precisely why we're excited to be working with this community to develop an innovative elementary schools program that carries the potential to reimagine what early learning can look like. We chose Citrus Heights specifically for an innovative schools program because of this community's desire for different types of learning and to take advantage of the opportunity to enhance and replicate practices that are showing promise in improving academic outcomes for students. It's against that backdrop that we encourage the City Council to consider whether these robust investments can be sustained as a small school district. There's no doubt that we have tremendous work ahead of us. Last year's academic achievement data has shown us that. But as our students and schools recover from the disruptions of the pandemic, stability, continuity, and ongoing resources to meet the diverse needs of Citrus Sites learners will be critical components to their success now and in the years to come. So on behalf of San Juan Unified's new leadership, we look forward to helping our district deepen its relationships here in Citrus Heights in ways that meet and strengthen our shared goals for academic excellence. Thank you. Thank you very much. So may I have, uh, are there any comments or questions uh, from uh, council? Mayor, Mayor Schaefer. I'm sorry. Um, I would just, I have one additional comment, oh. um, public comment from Zoom. Oh. Let's hear it. So Rick, Hodgkins, you can now unmute yourself to speak. Only I'm now unmuted. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I would like to first say I never went to school in Citrus Heights, although I did attend summer school at San Juan High School, not because I was a bad boy. It was more of a traditional, it was more of a transitional class for people with disabilities and other blind people. I learned to cook and we did activities and stuff like that, you know, when I was 10 years old and that type of thing. Um, and um, at one point I was gonna represent the IDD community because I'm developmentally disabled, you know, to um, along with John, what's his name? He used to be he used to represent, uh, he was a head of special education for the San Juan Unified School District. In terms and that with regards to the city of Citrus Heights, having our own school district, I can't say that whether or not I agree and or disagree, I'm neutral on that only because that we're not a big enough city. You know, I, I've i had my struggles with San Juan Unified School District because they knew I was blind, but that they did not know I had other disabilities. And this is when I was a kid in the school. I've been through three different school districts, Sac City, Folsom Cordova, and San Juan Unified, and that then I went to the California School for the Blind. Um, 
if I remember right, I did vote for Steve Miller and Tanya Kravchek or Tanya Kravchek to sit on the board. I would never vote for someone to sit on the San Juan Unified School Board if they did not have experience in the school district, if they've never even visited a school campus. And in closing, I would just say when the presenter, whatever her name was, talked about all the committees we have, I would mention that like the city and county of Sacramento, that the city of Citrus Heights is lacking a disability advisory committee. And I could see um, Alfred Sanchez, Arthur Ketterling and myself, mm -hmm. and maybe several others sitting on a disability advisory committee for the city of Citrus Heights. So let's add that to our list of committees here in the city. So, and by the way, I have an uncle who lives in Citrus Heights that works as an HVAC for uh, San Juan Unified School District, but I think he's retired now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other raised hands? I do not see any comment? other raised hands. Okay. Now I'll ask for uh, additional questions or comments from council. Mayor, I have a couple comments. Yes, please do speak. So when it comes to this, I have two children in the district, in schools, right here in Citrus Heights, two boys, one's in middle school, the other one's a special, the other child's special needs. And I, I get it. I understand what it's like to be a parent and want more for your children and to have to fight for that. But I think that we also should give the folks that we just recently elected the opportunity, our new superintendent, the opportunity to do the job. I don't know, but I can take a strong guess um, by just sitting here and looking around the room that no one here has most likely attended a school board meeting within the last month or two. I have, because I, you know, I go to the LCAP meetings because they're important. I need to understand what the district is doing and why they're doing it, how they're allocating dollars. I can almost guarantee that most folks haven't taken the time to read the over 100 page document that SCOE, the Sacramento County Office of Education has put out uh, LCAP is um, the Local Control and Accountability Plan, specifically the one to San Juan School District, and all the things that they do to serve our children. Yes, we need more, but by going, becoming a smaller district, we're not going to get more. By becoming a smaller district, you're going to lessen the education that my children get in Citrus Heights, and I'll be that person. They'll have to, unfortunately, take my children out of schools here because we are not prepared to deal with refugees, foster youth and homeless, English learners, African-Americans, students with disabilities, the LGBTQ plus community. We don't know how to do that. We don't, with the money that we would get, because we're only gonna get a small percentage of what we get as a larger district. We're not gonna have the capabilities. We're gonna push our children further behind. COVID was bad. It taught us a lot of tough lessons, but by forming our own district, prematurely, when we've got people who, are, who have more money and are capable, we've elected them. Give them the opportunity to do the job. You're up. Thank you. Um, man, I scrolled down so many notes, I don't know where to start, and I know I'm gonna get scrambled here at some point. Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate the comments that I heard from the, uh, the public. I thought a lot of them were really spot on make a lot of good points, and, and then some of them I just don't even understand. To say that uh, we would be a, a district that's too small, too poor, um, I don't think people understand how much money is spent on education and what an opportunity Citrus Heights would have. There are 19,000 school-aged children in Citrus Heights. If all of them went to school in Citrus Heights, that's not gonna happen, but if they did, that would bring over $250 million to this so-called small little district. It's not small at all. We're currently one quarter of the San Juan Unified School District. The problem is not that we would be too small. The problem is that the San Juan District is too big. I think they care. I believe they totally care. But they're committed to the San Juan Unified School District schools, which I think is 
I think 66, I might be wrong, but it's a lot of schools. And so we're just a portion of that and their decisions are made probably based on the bet what's best for the whole district, hopefully. Um, but that could be a detriment to us. Um, a long, long time ago, we decided that the best way for the people of Citrus Heights to control their future was to become a city. That made incredible sense. That's local control. And then we went on and we said, you know, the best way for us to provide police services in Citrus Heights was to form our own police department. And we went on and did that. And then over the years, we also looked at things and said, what's the best way to do that? And we, we brought a lot of our services in-house. Even though we're this little city, we understood that the best way for us to control things like cost and, and, and accountability and all of that was to bring it in-house. And so where we could do that, we've done that. We have, we have embraced local control. And we've seen in other areas around Sacramento County and probably throughout the state and wherever that also understood that local control was, was the way to get it done. And you see Elk Grove became a city. You see Rancho Cordova became a city. Um, they understood the power in local control. Now, the, the, the so-called Citrus Heights School District would not be part of the city, but it would enhance local control in that even though we've now elected these new board members, the, the only really solid representation we have for Citrus Heights is really one. The others contain areas that are much, like, mostly outside of Citrus Heights, was some, one just barely even really in Citrus Heights. So we don't know where that, that board member is really going to be. I love the three board members that we elected in regards to I think they'll do better for us, but they're still part of the San Juan district. They're outnumbered. You know, they're, they're outnumbered four to three. So even if they wanted to do everything they could for schools within Citrus Heights, they're outnumbered. So we don't have the local control that we think we have. It's better. I think it's much better, but it's nowhere near. And I hear this talk about this excitement about a new superintendent and new board members, while at the same time hearing people talk about how they've had that opportunity before, and that hasn't changed things. We've had new superintendents. We've had new board members. That hasn't changed anything. We've I almost used a bad word, but... We've griped and moaned about schools in San Juan for a long, long, long time. During that time, we've had a new superintendent. We've had new board members. I really liked the previous superintendent. I thought he was a great guy. I loved his excitement and, and stuff. But in the end, did we really see a change for Citrus Heights schools? I don't think so. Again, I think they care, but it, it's just a big district. So we wouldn't be a small district in my eyes at all we'd be a smaller district than we are now, which I think is a great thing, because I think that then allows the families that live in Citrus Heights to have a better control, better, better input with the five board members that I would imagine would be elected who would all be in Citrus Heights. It doesn't get any better than that. You know, it, it, it just doesn't get any better than that. All five board members would be accountable to the people in Citrus Heights. Right now, we have thousands of kids that flee the, Cit the uh, Citrus Heights area schools. You have to ask yourself, why? Why is that happening? I went to school here. I mean, I, I went to San Juan High School, not because I was a bad boy. Is that what he said? That was funny. Um, I'm a Spartan through and through, okay? My son went to Mesa Verde. Um, my other kids went to Grand Oaks, to Sylvan. My daughter's at Arlington Heights. What is she really? Yes, thank you for being the principal. Oh, fun. <laughs> um, this school district hasn't done one damn thing in the almost 300 days since the Uvalde shooting to strengthen security at my kid's school. You can still walk in the front gate with a big sign that says this gate must remain open during school hours, and my daughter's class is 50 feet away. They haven't done a damn thing. They could have hired somebody at minimum wage and gave them a walkie-talkie and asked them to stand outside and let them know if something's wrong. They haven't done a damn thing. So I think they care. I think they do care. But I think the problem is 
the Citrus Heights schools are also just part of the, the big district. They'll get around to it, but when? I think that we have a great opportunity to form a committee. We're not voting tonight to form a school district. We're voting tonight to see if uh, the speaker said, you know, do we want to have a fire department that's ready to do something here locally or whatever he said. Um, it, it's not that we're voting to form a school district tonight. We're, vo we're voting to form a committee to examine whether or not we want to have a school district. So give me just a moment. I want to look through my notes, Mayor, if I, if I missed anything here. Um, I don't think I have. So, you know, I, I'm just going to say this at the end. Um, I think the opportunity to have a school district in Citrus Heights would make a huge difference in the education of kids that live in Citrus Heights, for the parents that have children in Citrus Heights. Um, and um, I fully support forming a committee to examine, just to examine what that would take. Thank you. Jane. Thank you, Mayor. I've been thinking about this since we last had this discussion here, and my job has me going to all of the school districts, all of them. I have visited Citrus Heights schools in the last two weeks. I visited all the elementary schools, the K-8 schools. We have wonderful schools. When I attended the Innovation School evening, I was impressed with all the feedback that the parents had given. And I was also impressed talking with the principal. But he said something that I don't often hear. And he said, I have a community of parents here who are very involved in my school. And that st statement was very significant for me because as I visit other schools where they have principals that are inundated with behavioral issues, the one thing they say is they don't have parent community support. What we do in Citrus Heights, different from any other surrounding city, is we do community really, really well. What happened to the schools in our communities? I would suggest if we were going to do a half measure or something to really consider, we have amazing neighborhood associations. Can you put together projects to adopt your local schools and have your presence known as people who are interested in the thriving of those young minds? because that's the step that I think we can take with no other permission needing to be given. I think a committee is a good idea simply because we're considering an option. Again, we're not saying that we want to form this school district. We're simply saying we're taking into serious consideration the, the conduct, the level of success, thriving or struggle and challenge that is happening within our schools and we're looking to address the problems. So with, with all of the other comments, I appreciate all the comments both for and against because it's given us a lot of food for thought. But as I walk around to different schools both inside San Juan Unified School District and outside San Juan Unified School District, what I see as common success factor is parental and community involvement, whether you have a school, a, a child at that school or not. So I encourage that for food for thought for all of our already engaged citizens. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Jana? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, when, when we were running for office, the Sentinel sent us a little questionnaire and says, when you're considering something, you know, what three questions will you ask yourself? Remember that one, Mary Jane? And so, and, and you, were, you had a great answer too. And so I answered, do we need it? Do we want it? And can we afford it? Those were my three questions. So I said to myself, do we need it? Do we need to have our own school district? And I think the answer is, is probably yes, but all the statistics show that the students in Citrus Heights are not doing as well. But like Arlington is now upped its, its level. And I, I think it's, 
my observation of being principal of the day is that it has to do with the, with the uh, principal, his teachers, and the way they share a vision, similar to the vision that Mr. Feeney came to this city with a vision, and now he has us on board with his vision. So you have a principal, and he has all his teachers share his vision. That school is going to be successful because they're, they're putting forth. So I, I don't know. I think it's got to do with the way it's structured. They have a lot of, they're not told exactly what to do. He got to hire the teachers he, that shared his vision. And I, I, parents are a problem. Attendance is a problem. I mean, he can't control that. But the, he's just, he, he, he's, he's so incredible. He goes to bed at night thinking of ways to make things better, this principle. That's what we need is leadership in our principles. So, you know, we do probably need to set a set of parameters if we had a district of this is what we want it to look like. But so I'm going to leave do we need it as up in the air because I'd like to see the present administration and the present board members turn something around. But, but like John said, don't wait for the fire to send out the fire engines. So I do agree we should do some questions. So second question is, do we want it? Now, in the end, the whole issue will go to the voters. We, the council, is not going to make this decision. This ends up going to a vote either of the Citrus Heights people or the whole district may have to end up voting on it. So it's in the end, the arguments are going to go pro and con and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, do we want it is going to be up to the parents and the voters. So I go back to, can we afford it? So I look and I say, okay, what's involved with becoming your own school? What, what does it take? So I don't know. Somebody sent us stuff about uh, the Malibu and the Santa Monica school districts are trying to separate into two different districts. They started doing this in 2015. Now here it is, eight years later, and they're no better on being two separate districts than they were when they started. So this is a long process that we're looking at. Uh, so then you have to go to the county, and the county has to do some approval. Then you go to the state, and this criteria that you have to meet for the state to do it. But the best part was this year, and I got my glasses. I had to write this down because I almost didn't believe it. Malibu offered Santa Monica $40 million over 10 years, and it was rejected. So it's costly to, you know, you've got the bonds that San Juan has. We've got a cost. So I am in favor of investigating what it would take, because in the end, it may make the determination that I'm not in favor of a committee because I don't think a committee can make, it, you know, I think we need maybe a handful of two council members and maybe a couple of residents could be a committee of its own. Find out what's involved with doing it. What, what is it going to take? And if it's something that's so overwhelming, it may be something we don't want to be distracted from our current strategic goals. We have city goals right now, and I don't want to remove staff off of those goals. I don't want to spend money that we could spend on roads, on a, on a facilitator. And so I'd rather put our money where we've got it planned to do, and I don't want to see a cost associated with this. So if we have volunteers that want to get together and say, this is what it's going to take. These are the rules that you have to meet in order to accomplish this. And this is what it's going to cost you. They negotiate with San Juan. I don't think San Juan's going to negotiate to give away a fifth of their school district. So I, I think we need to know what we're getting into. But on the other hand, I, would, I, I, I see what Arlington has accomplished. And if the other schools could be like, like this, you know, where you have a, a manager and a responsive group that you're leading. And so I, I think that's where the district needs to come to looking at their structure of what goes on in the classroom. This guy is incredible. He's a great model. He takes uh, lessons in being an administrator. I mean, the guy is like super cool. So anyways, I, I, um, I, was, I was very educated. It's, it, you know, you, it's easy to condemn the outcome because the kids aren't learning, but I went to every classroom and watched and observed and I was, I didn't see your daughter. I didn't know which one she was, but I did probably see her. And I was very, very impressed. I was super impressed. And so, and it's hard to impress me. There's things the neighborhoods could do. I thought, I even suggested to him that we get the neighborhood involved. They, they could do a little garden out there and the neighborhoods could help plant a, I think that's uh, area three. So is that area three? I think it's area three. 
they could plant a little garden with the kids. Um, I suggested some fruit trees. You know, the kids would have fresh fruit. So there's things, they, they do need community partners, and I think we should be community partners. And we have to leave the parenting to the parents. I, I don't, if they're not supporting them at San Juan schools, they're certainly not gonna support Citrus High Schools either. So we're not gonna fix that. But I would support some investigation, but not a 21 member committee, not a staff commitment, and just somebody who wants to do some research, come up with a, a says, this is what it will take. Great. That's what I would do. Thank you very much. So I just, I, while you were talking, I just ran up the Arlington Heights school rating. It's rated a four on a scale of 10. And their uh, test scores are below average on no, a four of 10. Their equity is a four out of a 10. And how old is that data? It's current. What site are you on? I'm on greatschools.com.org. So anyway, uh, but th that's, uh, so um, with regard to, a, I sit on the uh, uh, Career Technical Education Advisory Board for El Dorado County. That's a, that is, is actually El Dorado Union High School District. That's four schools. That's, that's, you want to talk about a small school district? They do a phenomenal job. You look at the, the number of students that they transition to a four-year college degree is amazing. Now, this is El Dorado County, but that also includes Placerville. That includes El Dorado High School. That includes uh, many of the um, Union Mine High School. Uh, these are rural communities where very often that we, uh, now if you look at Oak Ridge High School and El Dorado Hills, that's a different animal. That's a, that's a very affluent community, but when you get up at, into Placerville and you get into the outlying areas, you have, we have some of the similar, similar problems that, we, that they have here. So with regard to, I don't think this is anywhere close to a small school district. Um, uh, in, in, with respect to that, it's still, uh, uh, I think it's still, but rolling back to what our original, what's in front of us now is, are we gonna establish this, this committee or not? Um, and, and I think that it, it's, it's a reasonable thing to, to explore. Um, uh, so, um, and as far as putting it off for two more years, so I've lived in Citrus Heights since 1989. By my, my math, that's going on 34 years. Um, I have put my kids through uh, the elementary schools in, in Citrus Heights, but I actually, my ex-wife lived in Roseville and I actually chose to send my kids to uh, high school in Roseville and at Oak Creek High School um, because that's a, that's a school that's rated a nine out of a 10. Um, it's a phenomenal school. I recently visited uh, on another CTE project I visited Folsom High School. I went through the through the uh, the classrooms there. I talked to the teachers, and that's a that's a school that's rated in a nine out of a ten. And I was asking, what makes this school so good? What is it? What is it about? And it is absolutely about parental in involvement, and it's about uh, it's about the district asking, demanding that students perform. Um, they and and that's that's something that I I have attended to the the, the school districts uh, uh, meetings where they're asking the students to, to perform at 54 percent of grade level um, that's concerning so that's that that is not asking the student to perform so just like when you get out into real life your employers are going to ask you to perform so Again, I'm rolling back to this is just a committee that we're, we're looking at. What's the feasibility? I think that the, yes, I'm, I'm not saying that there's not going to be any cost involved. Right now, we don't really have an idea what that will be. The, based on the timeline, we, we, we would expect to report back from this committee if we choose to form it sometime in February to see what is involved and what's the, what's the real thing. So I would suggest that the $40 million that uh, Malibu offered Santa Monica was pre the, the judge's judgment on that because the judge decided in that case that if the school is in Malibu, Malibu owns it. If it's in Santa Monica, Santa Monica owns it. And they certainly had some, dis some um, uh, arguments about what school bonds were still owed and that all got, is getting settled. But as far as my information that that will be on the ballot in November of 2024. If, it, if the citizens vote for the district to be formed, it forms the next day. So um, it, 
yes, it's a long process. I expected it would be a long process when I suggested this back in October. But if we don't start, if you don't start on the journey, you're never going to finish it. So with that, those are really my comments, and I'm, uh, I'm uh, up for, um, we're looking for simply direction at this point, correct? Do we have a motion? Do we have a? Yeah, a direction and a work plan. Okay. Do you need a motion for that direction? Problem? Yes. I, I would move that uh, we move forward with forming a Citrus Sites Education Advisory Committee. I would second that. That's a motion by Daniel, second by staff. Uh, can we call the roll, please? Councilmember Karpinski Costa. Mm. Not the way it's framed, no. Yeah. Councilmember Lopez Taff. Yes. Councilmember Middleton. No, it's ill framed. Vice Mayor Daniels. Absolutely. And Mayor Schaefer. Yes. So motion passes. All right, and next item, please. I think what's necessary is that we bring something back with the actual direction and formation. Um, maybe have council offer some suggestions in that, that arena. What I don't is, know, do we need to decide that tonight? I don't know if we need to. Would a study session be appropriate? No, I think there's a variety of options you want to expand on? Yeah, um, I mean, we have proposed if this is something that the council would like to take to one of the two by two committees to discuss the work plan um, and the time frame for this, that's an option um, that the council can, you know, the quality of life committee, the education and community programs committee, and then we could bring that back to a future council meeting for the city council to discuss and vote on it. I have a question for our city attorney. So Vice Mayor Daniels and I are on the education two by two currently. And if we wanted to discuss the framework of this particular committee, would that have to be, um, is that governed by the Brown Act? Do we need to hold it publicly? Can you give me some direction on that? Yes, probably. So I think that that depends on if that education committee is a, a standing committee or not. If if it is, then it's governed by the Brown Act. If it's not, and it's an ad hoc committee that meets sort of occasionally, then then no. But I think you would, you just logistically and practically speaking, you want to work with the other members that are on that to make sure they're comfortable with this item being on the agenda. My question was specifically, can I talk to my two by two partner for the the comp the how do we form a committee? What will be the the framework of the committee, just that, not the committee meetings or any of that? Y yes, you are allowed to talk to one other member. So if that person is whoever the other committee member is on the council, you can't have that conversation without a Brown Act issue. Okay, thank you. Good question. All right, any other questions or comments? I'd like to move on to the next item. What is that the council's desire to bring this to the a education council committee. education committee? Well, I, I, yeah. I just want to make sure I'm understanding the council's direction. I would agree with that. Education two by two. Education two by two, which is these two. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to item eight, please. The next item is regular calendar item number eight. The subject is resolution to approve a memorandum of understanding for Sayonara. Drive Replacement Housing Project. The recommendation is to adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into a memorandum of, a memorandum of understanding with Habitat for Humanity of Greater Sacramento for the Sayonara Drive Replacement Housing Project. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, Nicole Piva with the Community Development Department. Also tonight is Allison Bermudez with the uh, Community Development Department. And we here have tonight in the audience our partner, Habitat for Humanity, uh, Michael and Ann are here to answer any questions. Um, so tonight's recommendation is for staff um, to have Council approve the Memorandum of Understanding with Habitat for Humanity of Greater Sacramento for the Sayonara Drive Replacement Project. 
Outlined here are the city's goals and objectives. Improving the quality of life on Sayonara has been a long-standing priority for the city. Sayonara Drive was experiencing record number of calls for service. Resident turnover was extremely high. The housing stock was in disrepair and eventually causing a number of units to be boarded up and declared uninhabitable. The city began to purchase and demolish blighted properties on Sayonara as a five-year plan to reduce blight. While the demolition and dilapidated units, capital investments such as street lighting, the community center, and the park quickly improved quality of life on Sayonara. Here's a timeline of the project. This project began in 2009 when the city council adopted the Sayonara redevelopment strategy. September of 2010, the city completed demolition of 15 multifamily buildings. February of 2012, the redevelopment agency was dissolved and the city was obligated to replace 35 units at that time. July of 2012, the Sayonara Center opened and in no November of 20, 2012, the Sayonara Park was completed. And in February of 2018, the city extended the replacement requirement by five years. And in January of 2019, the city was able to allocate funding to the Sunrise Point project for replacement credits. And the credits were 23 units, bringing the city's obligation to 12 units. In March of 2022, the city council reviewed a mixed option and selected a 26 unit option. Highlighted in yellow are the city-owned properties. The city purchased these properties using redevelopment funds, and as mentioned, the city demolished units and relocated tenants using neighborhood stabilization funds. The Sayonara Park is located at 6550, and properties at 7832 and 6551 is now 7836, which is home to the Sayonara Center. The remaining properties will soon be redeveloped. So prior to 2021, the city looked for a development partner. After a long search, the city began discussion with Habitat. Habitat's dedicated to building and repairing hope, homes, and community. The new for sale housing units will be sold to income qualified families. The partnership with Habitat has been great and their model fits the city's objectives and goals. During the March 10th study session, the original conversation was to fulfill the city's replacement obligation at 12 units. The city's obligation would have been 1.4 million or $117,000 per unit. During this meeting, a mixed use of housing design options were discussed Council supported the concept of two single family units per parcel, increasing the density to 26 units. Recognizing the city would not be able to maintain financial contribution at the 117,000 per unit with the increase of 26 units, and so staff was able to identify funding that would contribute to, 70, to 73,000 towards each unit for a total contribution of 1.9. Um, this MOU with Habitat will attract um, funding sources. So this is a preliminary design for the units. The project will require entitlements through the planning division where they will have to approve the design, the layout, building materials will all be reviewed in detail. Some of the key objectives from the MOU is this project will be built over a three-year period. The project will provide home ownership opportunities to 26 income qualified families. Habitat's model is future homeowners will contribute 500 hours of sweat equity in the exchange for a 30-year mortgage at 0% interest rate. The city and Habitat will partner and will focus on providing local families with the opportunity to participate. The, this also will fulfill the city's replacement housing obligation. The estimated cost of this project is 7.7 million. 70% of the project costs will come from Habitat. 
which is the 5.4 million, and the remaining 2.2 will come from the city. So the MOU before you tonight includes the city's cash contribution of 1.9. There are no general fund dollars allocated to this project. Funding for the project comes from a variety of funding sources. And the main purpose of these funding sources outlined on this table is to support the production of affordable housing and increase opportunity for families to access housing. So the first three funding sources is the permanent local housing allocation from the California Department of Housing and Community Development. PLHA funds are used to provide housing related projects that assist in addressing the unmet needs. Council has already approved these funds to be used for this project to specifically fulfill the city's obligation. The Pro Housing Incentive Program is a new investment from HCD. These funds reward jurisdictions at the forefront for addressing affordable housing. Citrus Heights is one of seven cities in California to receive Pro Housing funds. And the Affordable Housing Impact Fee is established by the city. This is a fee that's collected during the time of a building permit. One thing to note, we know funding plans can be very complex with funding sources, have its own set of restrictions, reporting requirements, expenditure deadlines. In the resolution before you tonight, it'll outline that the city manager is able to reallocate funding if grant opportunities come up, but the overall city contribution will be capped at the 1.9. Next steps, um, while the cities identified their funding sources, Habitat is continuing to look for their contribution. Once the funding plan has been finalized, um, Habitat will submit for entitlements to the planning division and phase one of the project will begin. So with that, we're available for any questions and here's the recommendation before you tonight. Questions from council members? I have one. Dana? The sweat equity that the uh, homeowner will have, does that mean that's in lieu of any down payment that they make? Yeah, that's correct. They'll, they're required to do 500 hours, and that serves as a down payment. Does that mean like they, they paint and do the, the okay. Yeah, um, last Friday, Nicole and I participated in one of their build days, and it was really great. We did work alongside some of the future homeowners, and they were there sweeping, painting, um, and cool. doing projects, and they're very excited for their homes. Good. Okay, thanks. I don't know uh, if you can answer this question, but um, I would imagine these homes have some sort of restriction on the ability, the ability to sell them. That's correct. They will be restricted for the 30 years, the 30 years of the mortgage, um, where they, should they sell prior to the mortgage being paid off, it would be sold to another qualified buyer. And is there any restriction on renting them out? Can they own them and rent them out? They cannot rent them out. They cannot. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Jane? No? Okay. All right. Uh, are there any public comments? I have a couple of comment cards here. And I do have one on Zoom okay. as well. Please let's listen to the one on Zoom. So on Zoom, Rick Hodgkins, you can now unmute yourself um, and speak for five minutes. Rick Hodgkins, you have been unmuted and you had your hand raised to speak. Audio now unmuted. Is can it? you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought I unmuted myself. I, I do apologize. All right. About 15 years ago, coming up, I moved over here to where I'm living now because I lived at 77 Greenback Lane. Um, I was waking up. I was asleep one night, and I woke up in the middle of the night to noises. I lived at 77 Greenback Lane at the Renaissance Apartments. I lived uh, right behind my apartment complex was Sayonara Drive. And I bring this up as it relates to Sayonara Drive because 
my apartment was broken into, I was robbed. And so it's no surprise that Sayonara Drive is on the agenda for tonight's city council meeting. And so I applaud the city council for taking this up because it's high time. I know that there was work done about 13 years ago or 14 years ago, back in 2009 and 2010. It's obvious that way more work still needs to be done. And so I rise in support. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir. So I have two speaker cards. You're welcome to come up together if you like. Uh, Ann Gambino and uh, Michael Gordon. Gordon. We thought we were supposed to fill it out, you know. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, thank you, City Council. Thank you, Mayor, for uh, having us tonight. Um, I'm Michael Gordon. I am the uh, Director of Construction at Habitat for Humanity of Greater Sacramento. Um, we've been around for 36 years here, and we, uh, we have about a little over 160 homes that we've built. And we are we're also the bank. We're the mortgage company. So we hold the mortgage on all those. Um, one thing I wanted uh, to address about rentals you know, we, we do uh, do our best to police that. Because I'm not saying somebody hasn't done it, but we, you know, we, we do. We're, we're, we're very, um, we're on our program. It's very important that we stick behind our program. It's a very, we, we're getting money from people all over. It's all, you know, donated money, city money, county money, people, organizations. So we take it very, very personal. Um, one thing I can say about this project this will be the first project that I, I've only been with uh, the organization on staff for three years. But as far as I know, this will be the first one that we'll be doing any two bedroom, one bath. Um, my wife's been on for 17 or 18 years. Um, and so we, we, we haven't been able to help that part of the community. Um, and so we, there'll be two bedroom, one bath, three bedroom, two bath, four bedroom, two bath. But it's, it's kind of a big deal for the first time for us to be able to do some two bedroom, one bath for, for people. And um, as you saw, we were in the you know, design phase, and uh, our architect is really excited about doing this. Um, it's the first project we've done with him. Um, and we're all very excited about the whole thing. And the ladies were out there. I happened to be on the job the other day. It was muddy. It was wet. And they're painting. And I have a site supervisor who lives in Citrus Heights. And he's, he's telling them that he, they, they need to you know, tell uh, me that he needs to be the site supervisor so he doesn't have to commute anywhere anymore. Um, but uh, we have a very, very excited team, very excited program, and we look forward to this. So, any questions? Yeah, I have a question too for me. Oh. Are you are you going to come back and show us your design? What we saw looked like a bunch of squished houses together. <laughs> that, that, that's we're only you know we, we stop at a certain point until we we're all ready to go. But yes, Does it, correct. Doesn't look um, like there's room for the garbage can to get through between them. Yeah, they will. Um, we will go through the full entitlement process. They'll so design review for the project and will be brought forward. I brought up to um, Casey the idea of cluster homes. Is that something that would fit anywhere? The, I think I just think the cluster layout is nice, where everybody has a courtyard, and it and they and they and there's some one story for old people and some two stories for young people, and they all kind of get the two different generations in there and. Right, there, and, and for us, it, that's, that's more in the um, low-income rental. affordable housing. Yeah, it's more affordable rental that they do that. Um, with a space, normally we get like these lots, we're, we're going to be building two houses on each lot. They'll, have a, they'll be touching each house. They'll have driveways on the side. Oh. Um, we, we won't have that feature, but, um, you know, for, for the size of the lot, we're, we're being able to build two homes on each lot. So that takes it up to the 26. Okay. Will they have garages? Yeah. Okay, good. Yes, we, all of our, well, yes, all of our houses have garages. How many square feet is the house? They're anywhere from, um, we're building uh, 18 homes in South Sacramento right now. Uh, the three bedroom, two bath is uh, 1116 square feet. Another three bedroom, two bath is 1183. These are two bedroom? Three bedroom, two bath. We've never built two bedroom before. Oh, so this is, going to yes. be two, though. 
We, oh, for these homes? Yeah. It'll be a little smaller, the two bedroom, one bath. It, it'll be smaller than that. So about 960 the, square feet? The one we're looking at, is it 950? Nine, it's just under 1,000. Um, we, have, we have, from Habitat Inter International, we have guidelines we're supposed to go by. Oh, okay. And the two stories are 1,268 square feet, four bedroom, two bath. So, question? Yeah, I have a, oh, you have another one? Yeah. Um, so they, they, sweat equity takes care of the down payment, and then they have a mortgage? Yes. And how do you base the value of the mortgage? Come on up. <laughs> she she's the, she's say. the money person, yeah. and the, I'm a construction guy. So all of our homes are sold at the appraised value. And then we look at ways to make sure that the more, the actual mortgage that the homeowner pays on um, is no more than 30% of their monthly income. So the principal, the property taxes, and the insurance basically tell us what, what we are allowed in a first mortgage. The other part of the mortgage structure is then either forgiven or publicly subsidized by state or federal funds. Sometimes there's two layers of funding, sometimes there's three layers of funding, sometimes there's four layers of funding. But at the end of the day, the homeowner never pays a total mortgage payment of more than 30% of their income. And then um, they pay it to you? They pay it Habit to us. Humanity. We're the mortgage And then, you know, we're a mobile society anymore. Um, uh, 12 years from now, they decide they want to move. Uh, the house was 300000 now it's worth 400000 do they get the 400000 or no. how does that work? No. There is an equity share provision in all of our houses, um, which basically says that over time, if the value of the home increases after a certain period, after five years of living in the house, they share that appreciation value 50-50 with Habitat okay. so that we can plow that money That's back great. into building more homes. It's, it's to keep from flipping yeah, Primarily. basically from flipping houses, and it, and it builds wealth. It, Correct. It exactly. really has a, a way of. Um, so um, these families, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to no. steal anybody's thunder, <laughs> Portia. Okay. So these families that are that are going into this, is there a like a minimum income level that was yes. that's required? We serve thirty to eighty percent of the area median income. Okay. And what we strive to do is to make sure that a, that a mix of, of families in that range are able to um, apply. So I, I realize this is kind of beyond your, yeah. might be a little bit beyond your scope. Is there any uh, like financial or economic education that comes along with buying? Yes, your, the homeowners are required to, to take um, education classes. Oh, cool. And there's ongoing assistance uh, to the homeowners for problems that arise, you know, life happens, especially to low-income families. So we're, our homeowner services department is always available for assistance. So if, they for, have a, so if they have an issue with plumbing or something, they call you so they don't get ripped off by? During the, f during the warranty program, we stand behind our installation and our construction. After the warranty period, we do provide guidance as to where they can go and we might even recommend a number of options for them. Good. We, we are a, you know, it, it, we are a uh, licensed general contractor, and it goes under the, you know, the Sometimes one year. Sometimes, though, people get, people get hoodwinked by, by... Right, correct. And they call us all the time, and we have a list of people we can recommend. Okay. Um, you know, we're... Habitat for Humanities are probably the only developers that work in the world and lose money on every house they build, oh, you know, that's so good. <laughs> because it's, but we, it's the reason we, you know, why we build and now, what we do. And now I have a kind of an uncomfortable question. What's the rate of foreclosure with a habitat for humanity? Zero. Zero. Well, we have not 30. foreclosed yet in 36 years. That's right. Wow. That's fantastic. Oh, that's great. We, we really work with our homeowners, not to say, not to say there hasn't been some uncomfortable situations or we had to, for, mm. you know, move some payment down later, um, but we do, I mean, we, we do bend everything. bend over backwards to make yeah. sure that the yeah. families stay in their homes. Yeah. God bless you. That's all I had. Adios.
Do Thank you. Do, you. do you make them mow their lawn and all that stuff? Or <laughs> there is actually a provision. If we would drive down the street and yeah. it looks unsightly, is that's, there something? That's exactly right. There's provisions in our, in our deed that requires them to keep maintenance. Is it like an HOA they form, all the little groups that they all know? Mm -hmm. Well, you can maintain it. That's, I mean, at least make them maintain we it. We make them maintain it. Yeah, we make, and I, I'd be driving around, and if I'll see something like they're Shopping cards. Rugs out over the fence, because, you know, they're, I go to homeowner services, homeowner services makes a call. You know, we try. You know, got 136, 160 properties, you know, it's, but yeah. You they police that. themselves a lot. Mm -hmm. um, That's good. Each other. Yes. If you ever want to come out and see what we build, the ladies can tell you. you. Can <laughs> we build very nice you homes. You can muck around in the mud just like they did. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and move staff's recommendation. Um, okay. Moved by Daniels. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, motion by Daniels. Second by Middleton. Uh, can you call the roll, please? Councilmember Karpinski Costa? Yes. Councilmember Lopez Taff? Yes. Councilmember Middleton? Yes. Vice Mayor Daniels? Yes. And Mayor Schaefer? Yes. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next item, please. Next item is regular calendar item number nine. The subject is Citrus Heights Business Attraction Incentive Program Approval. The recommendation is to adopt a resolution approving the Citrus Heights Business Attraction Incentive Program Guidelines and allocating $1 million in American Rescue Plan Act funds to administer the program through June 30th, 2024. Thanks, Amy. Good evening, Mayor Schaefer, members of City Council. I am Megan Huber, Economic Development and Community Engagement Director. Uh, this item uh, this evening is following through on a strategic objective that was set by City Council at our most recent strategic planning retreat. So for an agenda, we'll go through some background of this item for consideration, the proposed program guidelines, the application process that's been designed, as well as the program parameters. Uh, so as I mentioned, this was a strategic item that was set under one of four key focus areas within our focus area work plan, codified by council as the primary uh, strategic plan that sets direction through uh, mid-2024. The strategic objective was to present to city council program guidelines and recommendations to develop a grant program utilizing American Rescue Plan Act funding that advances economic development goals of effectively attracting and retaining target businesses and industries. So this would be a very key tool in our economic development toolbox that has the ability to contribute greatly to our shared economic development goals. Uh, the program guidelines are really designed with this intention in mind to enhance the city's competitiveness in the attraction of businesses that contribute to economic diversification and impact, community vibrancy, and or quality of life. I want to pause here and underscore that these guidelines were really truly designed uh, with Citrus Heights individual community needs in mind, taking into account our current uh, diversification or lack thereof in our local economy, the current vacant real estate that is available, we can only ever attract what fits in our available real estate, as well as the desires of our community. So all that to say, it will be a little bit different than you may see from other cities in the Sacramento region, but that's because it's designed for citrus sites. So the program guidelines uh, really have two key categories. The first is it promotes business attraction funding for target businesses. So this is exactly what I'm talking about, designing around what we've heard from our community that they desire to see and experience uh, in local businesses. That includes restaurants, uh, coffee, uh, including bars, coffee and tea shops. National chains do not qualify so that we can really hone in on on local mid-size restaurant opportunities, especially focusing on filling our vacant full-service restaurant real estate. 
Uh, it also promotes the attraction of breweries and other craft beverage businesses. We've heard from our community that they want a place to clink glasses. We, we were looking for um, what they call nowadays that third place. Outside of our homes and outside of our works, folks are looking for places to meet and connect. And those are certainly two categories that absolutely qualify. And then the third, I think we uh, can all agree, we've heard this from our community quite a bit, we're uh, hungry for entertainment opportunities. So things like bowling alleys, movie theaters, performing arts, and entertainment values. Now, these target businesses, these are very specific, and I'm happy to report we have great conducive real estate for that. We also don't want to write ourselves out of opportunity. So in addition to having these target categories, we're also building in flexibility with really intentional language um, so that we can follow the market wherever it leads. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know everything that's out there yet, so we want to stay nimble, and these, this guideline language allows for that. So um, in terms of flexibility, the program guidelines uh, support and provide eligibility for businesses that serve to diversify the city's economic base and or enhance community quality of life by providing unique or underrepresented goods or services. Now we've also written something that although um, this program will be great to fill our existing vacant real estate, we also acknowledge that there is opportunity if there's not real estate that is a fit for a potential business to attract to Citrus Heights, we acknowledge that there might be an opportunity for new construction in existing commercial centers because that will still provide benefit of creating foot traffic, increasing synergy, and providing that living room space that our community desires. In terms of value of incentives, we also intentionally uh, did not put a cap or parameters around the request. You will see a recommendation from staff on the uh, total number for the pot as it stands, uh, but we didn't put a cap because um, we know what we will see in terms of eventual requests will be very individual. Needs of a potential restaurant will be very different than a need of a potential let's say movie theater. Those are very different tenant improvements that may be needed that vary from site to site uh, and uh, vary on business plan as well. So eligible businesses can receive a grant on terms to be negotiated and it will really be all about the compelling application that's submitted. Uh, the funds uh, can be used for some combination of relocation, operating equipment, or other legitimate and customary startup or business costs, all of which will be included in the application process. You'll see that language as well. The value of the incentives identified will be within the discretion of the city, and it will totally depend on the unique attributes of each project because we know that each application will be very individual. So the application process, again, it's uh, not formulaic. It's meant to be very responsive to individual business needs. So uh, to submit an application, we would ask that they submit uh, the qualifications that you see on screen and the um, the bullet points of information requested really allow us to paint a total project picture and be able to qualify and quantify the benefit to the community that this potential business would provide. Uh, there would be um, top line underwriting as well, so we would request a pro forma as well as a business plan to ensure viability. And then we do also have some qualifications uh, if it is a young business for business coaching so that we're all doing everything we can to ensure success together. So the application and approval process, we've worked to make it as simple as possible. The request will be reviewed and verified, and then staff would prepare a proposed incentive package and agreement. This would then go to city manager and city attorney for review. Package is less than $5,000. It's recommended may be approved by the city manager. Uh, that is candidly fairly nominal when you're talking about business startup costs, so it's our intention to create a program that's as nimble as possible uh, so that we can move as quickly as a business wants to. Packages at more than 5,000, a recommendation will be presented to city council for consideration. 
So in terms of program parameters, staff recommends allocating $1 million in American Rescue Plan Act funds to activate the program available through June 2024. Now, that's a really important point. If the program is adequately subscribed and or oversubscribed, staff will bring back recommendations for additional funding. We would certainly want to attract even more business uh, and, and uh, recommend a program term extension as well. If the program is not adequately subscribed, that would still give us six months of opportunity to reallocate that American Rescue Plan Act funding before the term ends at the end of the year, December 2024. Staff also recommends that up to 3% of the allocation can be used for administration costs of the program, including marketing and promotion. The program doesn't do us any good if we don't effectively share it, so we want to take into account effective marketing plans as well. Uh, and with that program promotion, we plan to go full throttle, make sure we share this far and wide, uh, both uh, locally and maybe even some national media. I mean, it's a, it's a really great program. It's the city committing uh, resources to attract business. It's always a great story. So we'll use a mix of media to be able to get the word out. But really, most importantly, um, your economic development staff uh, will uh, work directly with uh, the development community uh, from top down. So this information will be shared with our property owners, property managers, the Sacramento region broker community, as well as direct outreach to prospect businesses. So this is the staff recommendation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions from council members? You wanna start there or me? Uh, uh, start with you. Okay, I have a couple questions. So. What do they use the money for generally? I'm just curious, like signage or? It's possible, signage is possible. Um, when we're talking about those target businesses in particular, restaurants, breweries, entertainment, the available real estate that Citrus Heights has for those concepts are in uh, moderate to poor condition, candidly. So uh, if, if I had to speculate, I would say that that would be used to improve the physical building, do tenant improvements, and prepare the real estate so that it can be used by the business concept. Do you list the real estate? Let's say I owned a restaurant and I wanted to come to Citrus Heights. Is there a space I can go to see what sites are available? Is there a list to say? Because, you know, when you move a restaurant, you got to have the... the, the structure in place for your ovens and all that? Absolutely, and absolutely. It's required, like, just like when you build a house and you gotta have a vent that goes up and all that. Yes. In fact, well, I tell you what, um, your economic development staff uh, has even better customer service than that. We don't just do a list. Um, we'll go so far as to schedule a meeting with a prospect business. We have a subscription to CoStar, which is a real estate database. Uh, so we'll select baseline recommendations. I so have a great are, work. These sites are great for restaurants. Exactly. Great for bowling alleys. Exactly. And um, I mean, certainly your city staff has spent enough time on the ground. We also have a working knowledge of, of the vacant restaurants, which have hoods. That's usually a high cost. That's the next question a restaurant would ask, which has other kitchen infrastructure that is usable. What has been gutted? And we're starting from vanilla shell. So we're able to go so far as to make those recommendations. Can you call BJ's and Mimi's? And Duly <laughs> noted, BJ's and Mimi's. Uh, I have another question. Wait a second. Um, hang on, I just, oh, do we have such thing as point of sale businesses in Citrus Heights? Because you can, you can have a small space and generate a lot of sales tax if you have point of sale businesses. You absolutely can, and that's a great question. In terms of quantifying community benefit, sales tax is absolutely a great benefit. And the question to ask to know what kind of provision a, a business can contribute is if they have a point of sale, because that ensures that that is where their sales are noted. Um, so that is a qualifying question when we talk to potential businesses. And past that, it's an important question to ask because um, if you're not familiar with a business concept, there's some surprising stuff out there that you wouldn't necessarily assume uh, produces revenue and, and some gems hiding in plain sight. So very important question. I get that's the end of my questions. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that uh, for the grants, there would be terms to be negotiated. Are you indicating that they would pay the money back? No. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure that, I, that it didn't include the payback. Yes, this okay. is an incentive, absolutely. Excellent. Thank you, that's it. 
I just have a comment. Uh, very good job. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, you've done a, a wonderful job with this. So, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So, but we're going to need you to calm down just a yeah, little yeah. bit. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you look like you're ready to go out and party. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, so can I have a motion, please? Uh, Mayor Schaefer, I would oh. like to note, um, I do have one raised hand. Oh, I'm sorry. To speak. Uh, can I have some public comment then, please? Okay. Yes, so Rick Hodgkins, you can now unmute yourself to speak. Audio oh, now unmuted. Thank, I, thank you. Um, can you, can, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, I support this. I just would like to note and report that within the city, we have three different McDonald's restaurants. I used to work at one of them, uh, on the one on Sunrise and Old Auburn down the street. It's about a, about a half a mile down the street from my house. That one and that the one <clears throat> further down the street on Sunrise and Madison are both owned by this, they're both run by the same franchisee. And that then we have another one across town from here on Greenback and Auburn, also owned by a different franchisee. I just wish that we didn't have, uh, I just wish we just had one McDonald's, um, um, you know, talk about national chains. Um, <clears throat> It's a shame national chains are not allowed in this proposal because the only national chain I would like to see if they were allowed is a Dunkin' Donuts because if you want a Dunkin' Donuts, if you want anything from Dunkin', you have to go to the next town up, that which is either Carmichael, Folsom, and or Roseville. We don't have a Dunkin' Don't we don't have a Dunkin' here in Citrus Heights and since going to a Duncan, I've always wanted one here in Citrus Heights, and they're not just known for their donuts anymore. They're known for their coffee, just like places like Pete's Coffee and Tea, that which is not really a national chain. They actually started in the San Francisco Bay Area in Berkeley, California, and then Starbucks, of course, is a national chain. <clears throat> but... Um, so I, I support this, but I wouldn't narrow it to just local businesses. I mean, let's get rid of the McDonald's that we have too many of them, but you know, Dunkin' is not really that bad. Um, I would allow for a Dunkin' Donuts, but other than Dunkin', let's stick to only local vibes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Any future comments or any other comments from council? Can I have a motion, please? I'd I'll like move the move staff recommendation adopt. that the city council adopt a resolution approving the business attraction incentive program guidelines and allocating $1 million in American Rescue Plan funds to administer the program through June 30, 2024. Well, I'll second. All right, call the roll, please. Councilmember Karpinski Costa? Yes. Councilmember Lopez Taft? Yes. Councilmember Middleton? Yes. Vice Mayor Daniels? We have six McDonald's. Yes. And Mayor Schaefer? Yes. All right, motion passes. So, may I have the, excuse me, next item, please. The next item is uh, item number nine. I'm sorry, item number 10, the subject is Municipal Code Chapter 42, Flood City Ordinance Update. The recommendation is to introduce for a first reading, read by title only, and waive the full reading of an ordinance of the City of Citrus Heights, amending Chapter 42, Floods of the Citrus Heights Municipal Code. Good evening, Mayor Schaefer, Council Members. I'm Leslie Bloomquist, City Engineer with the General Services Department. Here tonight to talk about the proposed updates to Chapter 42 of the Citrus Heights Municipal Code relating to floods. Citrus Heights has over 26 miles of creeks, and with creeks comes water, which I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with these days. 
And although we have many programs and projects in place, flooding does occur along our creek system during heavy events, and that system is designed to accommodate that extra water. The area that is designed to hold the extra overflow water is called the floodplain, and any new construction proposed within or near a floodplain is reviewed by the engineering division to ensure it meets best practices and city code for flood protection. To provide additional protection, in 1997, the city joined the National Flood Insurance Program, or the NFIP, which makes federally backed flood insurance available to our residents. Recently, code changes uh, did occur to the NFIP and they were adopted. In order to continue participation in this program, the city must adopt the recommended ordinance changes to chapter 42 to align with those recent updates. In addition, FEMA offers a voluntary community incentive program recognizing and encouraging communities with practices that exceed the minimum requirements. This FEMA incentive program allows property owners to obtain discounts on their flood insurance premiums as a result of various efforts put in place by the city. Adoption of the ordinance updates before you tonight are required for the city to begin the process of becoming one of these communities to be able to provide access to those insurance discounts. Specifically, the recommended code updates for consideration tonight include additional definitions of terms and descriptions, updated reference dates for federal insurance rate maps, updates for consistency with revisions to state code, inclusion of additional requirements and submittals for floodplain and waterway alterations, and deletion of references to FEMA map zones that have since been removed from standards. I am here to answer any questions, but the recommended action for tonight is to introduce for first reading, read by title only, and waive the full reading of the ordinance amending chapter 42 of the municipal code. Okay, questions or counsel? Jane? I have a question. Um, with the amended flood maps, how many how many changes are we anticipating in citrus sites? Uh, FEMA has released new uh, draft maps um, that change the limits of the floodplain. I don't recall the number of new um, parcels that will be impacted by those floodplains, um, but those that are uh, would be able to participate in this program should the ordinances be adop adopted tonight. And do they get notice individually? Uh, the city has been noticing them ourselves. We have compared the old maps to the new maps and reached out to all those property owners directly. We did hold a public meeting a couple months ago informing them of the new process, the changes in the maps, and where to submit comments to FEMA directly. Thank you. Can I just get clarification? I, I'm, I'm hoping I misunderstood you. Are you saying that they've created new maps and those new maps now f push home existing homes or properties into what is now a floodplain? That's the case in some instances, yes. FEMA has updated the maps. They have updated topography and have run new models that show new limits of the 100-year floodplain. Some parcels come out of the floodplain. Other parcels have um, been added into the area that is the new floodplain. So you could have owned your home, bought it with no issue of thinking you have to have flood insurance, which is really costly. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they're going to come and change the rules and tell you that you have to have flood insurance. The map, yeah, the FEMA has updated the maps. Um, they are, don't require the insurance. If they do have a mortgage, those mortgage um, companies are the ones that typically require the insurance. FEMA makes that insurance available. Um, that's kind of how the process works. The city is just kind of helping to facilitate that. That's horrible. That's absolutely horrible that you could come along, own your home for 20 years, and all of a sudden they're going to change a map and, and you're going to be forced to have flood insurance. That, that's just horrible. That's all. Gina, do you have a question? Actually, Mary Jane asked the question I was going to ask, but now I thought of another one. It's like, we're doing good on our sandbag stuff. People are picking them up when I come to City Hall. I see people doing them. And um, I just want to say, I saw, our, if you're getting sandbags, I saw a cool thing on the news. You take a orange cone that's in the, instead of shoveling it into the bag, you take the orange traffic cone and you put the, the skinny part into your bag and you scoop the sand into the cone and your bag's full. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, have we had much flooding from our creeks? Question. It, you know, all these rains, have we had residents 
that are flooding? Uh, you know, I'd have to check our system for the number of calls that we have got. Um, we do receive regular calls for flooding. I also have seen our sandbag station um, very popular this year, so hopefully that's been helping with a lot of those issues. But as far as total numbers of calls and locations, I'd have to get back to you with that information. I just thought of it. I'm sorry, I didn't ask sooner. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments from council? I'm good. Okay. So any uh, any public comment on this? I do not have any public comment. Okay. May I ask for a motion? Can I have a motion, please? Who's first? I'll make a motion. We introduce for first reading, read by title only, and waive the full reading of ordinance number 2023-in the ordinance of the City Council of the Citrus Heights amending chapter 42 of the Citrus Heights Municipal Code. We have a second? Second. Okay, motion by Karpinski Casa, second by Middleton. And please call the roll. Councilmember Karpinski Casta? Yes. Councilmember Lopez Taft? Yes. Councilmember Middleton? Yes. Vice Mayor Daniels? A uh, symbolic no. <laughs> and Mayor Schaefer? Yes. Okay, next item, please. Next item is regular calendar, item number 11. The subject is Senate Bill 316, Prevent Serial Theft, Request for Letter of Support. Uh, the recommendation is for Council to consider the request. And in the City Council staff report, um, we provided information. So on March 17, 2023, the City received a request from Senator Roger Nilo's office seeking City Council support of Senate Bill 316. In your uh, staff report was a fact sheet as well as a sample support letter for Council consideration. And with that, um, I turn it over to the Council. I have a question. So, Assemblyman Hoover introduced one at his committee and it failed. It was similar. Now, Senator Nilo has this one for it. But then I got a thing from League of Cities action alert for Assembly Bill 1708 that does the same thing. So, can we? You seen, have you seen 1708? It's the same as Nilo's. You seen it? It amends Proposition 47 to increase accountability for repeat theft offenders and offer pathways for pre-plead diversion programming. I hate that. Is that oh. introduced by a Democrat? Whoever it is. Mora it is. Tucci is. Okay. It, it looks similar. We would have to bring that back. Uh, I'm just cautious, saying if, you know. Just caution the council. That, that is not on the agenda. If you're asking just as okay, I just wondered if you knew about it. This one, so that's one you, thing, but we I couldn't take a position on that one. I wondered if you knew more about that one. Okay. Okay. Do we have a, uh, let's see here. Any, any other comments? From I, I have a couple of comments on this one. Um, this is one of those things where we're looking for solutions, and I get it. And I, I support, you know, the legislation, for legislators for trying to increase public safety, especially here in Citrus Heights, where we've seen these, you know, smash and grabs, this, this, this overrun of robberies happening in our community. My, my potential concern is that we're early on in a two-year bill cycle. This bill could change, it could morph, it could be pulled by the member. Um, um, Ms. karpinski Costa just mentioned two or three other bills that have, are similar. And I think we should give us a little bit more time before we put our foot out there. Um, because when, this is going to have to go back to the voters. This will be the second time that folks have tried to repeal Prop 47. And if it does not have bipartisan support, it's not going to work. I want to see where the author goes with this, what kind of amendments he's willing to accept, how tight this is really get. Is it actually going to solve the problem? Is it something that the voters are actually going to get behind? Because we've done it twice. We've wasted valuable taxpayer dollars, valuable time, and with three other bills that look similar to it, this early in a two-year cycle, it just seems that we should take our time on this and wait. Yes, sir. Um, I, I would recommend that we fully support this. Um, what's going on in our county, our state, is just unconscionable. It's a result of a couple of things. It's, result, it's, it's, it's a result of a state legislature that has cared more about 
criminals than victims. And it's a result of a, an ability in the past to, to um, nefariously title certain um, propositions on the ballot to trick people yeah. into voting a certain way. And that's what happened with this totally. Um, it was disgusting and um, it needs to be remedied. And Senator Nilo, Nilo is going to be able to gain that support, that bipartisan support. The, there's gonna be a Democrat version of this bill in the assembly and we should support that too, I think, and, and, and bring that back. But we need to take action. We need to show the legislature that we support the effort to fix um, what was definitely uh, uh, a, a travesty uh, on the California voters when they ended up supporting the, the original bill. Well, one thing Hoover said at his community meeting was the committee chair of his committee, the Public Safety Committee, announced that during his tenure as chair, he will not allow any bills to go through that enhance penalties, the jail, whatever. So this bill, in case you're unfamiliar, takes the shoplifting, the smash and grabbers who take $950 worth of less that's considered a misdemeanor. So what this bill does is say, if you get three of these little misdemeanors, you are now a felon, punishable by more jail. So it's unlikely that any of the assembly bills are gonna get passed. So Nilo's is going to the Senate hearing on the 28th, I think it says the 28th, 28th, so we need to act today. If we, and if he has to amend it, be that as it may, if the committee wants to amend it. So I fully support this as, as a sign that if it's not gonna pass assembly, we gotta hit the Senate. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, I, I'm with Vice Mayor Daniels on this one. I think we need to lend our support as a city to, to support bills that are moving forward that support our economic development and growth. We already know that smash and grabs do not promote good financial stability for a business. And so I think we should lend our, our support to these types of bills. I agree. I think we have a consensus. We need a recommendation. I'm gonna go ahead and yes. uh, make a motion that uh, staff's recommendation, that we approve staff's recommendation for a request for a letter of support of SB 316. Second. Second. Oh. Okay. You're gonna have it. You wanna call the roll? I don't see a motion and a, I don't see a, on, am I missing it? You, um, Council Member Daniels made one, but I also would okay. like to note I do have a raised hand from a member of the public too. Oh, okay, speak. sorry, sorry, my, my apologies. Um, Rick Hodgkins, you can now unmute yourself to speak. Audio now on. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. You. Okay, great. Um, yeah, like I said, I was robbed at the last place I lived, so now that to prevent being robbed, um, I have pipe, PVC pipe, put in all my windows, and um, I can't say that whether or not uh, I support the bill or oppose it, but that what I will say is what I've learned is people people do bad things for many different reasons, you know, because they don't they don't have they don't have access to services or what have you. But I will say that um, you know I would agree people are tricked into voting to reduce penalties, so. I will just leave it at that, and um, good luck with this bill. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir. So we have a motion and a uh, second. Uh, please call the roll. Councilmember Kirpin C. Hosta? Yes. Councilmember Lopez Taft? Yes. Councilmember Middleton? No. Vice Mayor Daniels? Yes. And Mayor Schaefer? Yes. All right, next item, please. Next item is department reports number 12. The subject is proposed California Bill AB 742, Law Enforcement Police Canines. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Alex Turcott, your police chief. Uh, tonight, I'm here at the request of council to provide an overview on Assembly Bill 742, and that's what we'll start doing. So, um, 
This is presented uh, Assembly Bill 742. The author of 742 makes three significant assertions in the bill as a basis for the legislative intent. The first is that police canines have been a mainstay in the country's dehumanizing of people of color and that there's a, they're a part of a dark history of abuse um, historical to America. The second assertion is that police canines uh, pose a severe and potential, potentially deadly consequences for bite victims. They cite a source saying that of people who were bitten by dogs, 67% of them had to go to the hospital. And some folks did suffer permanent physical disfigurement. The third assertion is that injuries caused by uh, police canines can result in severe injury or death, and that in those cases of police use of force resulting in severe injury or death, police canine bites accounted for 12% of the cases that have severe injury. All right, moving on. Now the legislative intent. If passed, the bill will cause peace officers not to use unleashed canines to arrest or apprehend a person. Canines shall not be used for crowd control. Canines shall not be used in any circumstance to bite Law enforcement may not train canines in the above behaviors, but canines will still be allowed to use to be used for search and rescue, as explosive detection, and narcotic detection, as long as those behaviors do not um, cause bites. Talk about some of the current legal standards that already exist today, separate from any of the proposed legislation. Uh, currently, an officer may only use a level of force that they reasonably believe is proportional to the seriousness of a suspected offense or that's reasonably perceived level of actual or threatened resistance. Secondly, an officer must intercede whenever they reasonably believe another officer is using excessive force. Also, an officer must carry out all duties in a manner that is fair and unbiased. Also, police canine bite force, uh, according to recent case law, is considerable but does not rise to the level of deadly force. So in discussions, the courts um, understand that a bite can be severe, but they place it a little above standard less lethal devices like a taser, but definitely below um, the use of deadly force as far as consideration. Our own policy here at the Citrus Heights Police Department, policy 316.6, our canines may be used to locate and apprehend a suspect if the canine handler, which is the police officer, reasonably believes that the individual has committed, is committing, or is threatening to commit any serious offense, and if any of the following conditions exist, Basically, the suspect poses an imminent threat of violence, the suspect's physically resisting or threatening to resist arrest, or the suspect's concealed in an area where the canine entry would be safer for the officers and or the public. Citrus Heights Police Department has never used canines for crowd control, and that's, that's certainly not a best practice in the industry. These are our local uh, canine utilization demographics. Um, and in, in conferring with our Cal California Police Chiefs Association, the preliminary data they're seeing across the state is showing something similar to the demographic breakdown. So here from 2014 to 2022, which is the data we have currently available to us, 67% um, of those bitten by our police canine in lawful course and duty um, were white, 15% black or African American, 16% Hispanic, and then 2% other. Next to that, you'll see the basic census data for the city of Citrus Heights. And while there are some differences there in the numbers, um, well, you can see for yourself, 64%, 4% uh, black, 20% Hispanic, and 12% other as far as how general census data goes. Canine deployments. So uh, this is a breakdown of our deployments. One of the assertions, um, from the, the law, the legislator in this particular case was um, the viciousness of the canines and the, uh, the seriousness of bites. I uh, wanted to point out to uh, counsel that while canines can be used to apprehend suspects and, are, and do bite to do that, um, the majority of our deployment does not involve bites. In fact, it's around between one and 3%, depending on the year that you're looking at it, of the amount of lawful deployments versus bites. You'll see here in the breakdown to help define that. Um, in the orange, this deployment area here, that's anytime the dog is taken out of the car for a police purpose. So that could be 
um, searching a possible burglarized home, that could be um, you know, on a car stop, that could be holding a perimeter position. Um, this yellow where it says deployment resulted in arrest but no bite, that's where the handler can draw a specific correlation that the presence of the canine caused the suspect to give up, de-escalated the situation, or otherwise was the means by which the suspect was apprehended even though there was no bite. And then the remaining blue section here is the standard, what you would think of, of canine apprehension through a bite. And then just to see on 2022, uh, it's a similar breakdown there as well. And you can see that the, uh, the bite's the smallest piece of the, the workload. All right, that is the basic overview. I'm happy to answer any questions. Aww. Viva. Now to be specific, Viva is just a detection dog. The other two, Cash and Jack, that are pictured here are um, protection, standard, or they would be used for apprehension, but they're also cross-trained either in narcotic det detection, um, gun detection, or article searches as well. I understand you went to the hearing. I did, yes. Somebody fessed up and saw you there. Yes, <laughs> I did, yeah. How did it go? It was interesting, yeah. So I represented uh, California police chiefs as one of the opposition witnesses. And what happened at the hearing? I, it moved forward, so it's now going to the Appropriation um, Committee. Does it help if we do a support against it? What do you call it? Opposition, opposition. to it? If that's the pleasure of counsel, there's still plenty of time to indicate support or opposition. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, it's a fact. Canines prevent injury and death to police officers. It's just a fact. And, you know, in doing law enforcement for 20 years, um, somebody will take on four police officers that are six foot five and 280 pounds, but they won't take on a dog. <laughs> they will comply almost always. I don't remember one time when somebody said, yeah, go ahead and send in the dog, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, it, it is a tool that is beyond value just for, again, injuries to police officers and death to police officers. And we should do everything we can to oppose this bill. Um, I don't think we can vote on it tonight, but uh, I would like that we bring it back for a formal uh, letter of opposition to the bill. Okay. Any other comments, Portia? I don't have any at this time. Okay. Thank you so much, Chief, for participating in that process, and thank you for your report tonight. No problem. And I absolutely support Vice Mayor's assertion that uh, I'd love to see this come back so we can support it. Okay. All right. And Mayor Schaefer, I did have a request from a member of the public to speak. Okay. Uh, Rick Hodgkins, you're now um, able to unmute yourself to speak. Yeah, now. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Um, I reluctantly rise in support of this bill. I say reluctantly because it sounds like that the vast majority of you are opposed. I don't know the author of the bill. I have on my channel, I have on my iPhone, the channel three app that which is how I heard about this bill. And that then about a month ago, uh, I watched the city council meeting on Metro cable channel 14 and um, it, that's how I heard about it again, and um, it was asked that <clears throat> you guys bring it up again, that which you guys are, it sounds like you're going to bring it up again. Um, and just like Chief Turcott said, what the bill prevents dogs from doing, uh, when I was about knee high, one or two, about one year old or two years old, I was, I can't remember if I was bitten by a dog in the face or was knocked over by a big dog. It was not a police dog. It was a pet dog, not a police dog. Nevertheless, I was afraid for my life. I was short or maybe knee high, if not shorter than your average infant or toddler due to growth and development issues. And so, I will not pet a dog. I don't know if it's a dog. I don't know. I will be scared to death because I have multiple disabilities, as I stated before in one of my earlier statements on a item brought up earlier. Um, 
<clears throat> so most people, particularly if it's a person with a disability, um, if they're being sought up by police, I mean, search and rescue is one thing, but um, so I want to be very, you know, that we need to be very careful here, particularly when we're, you know, if it's a person that's being search and rescued, that's one thing, but if it's a person with a disability, if they're being suspected of having done something wrong, we need to be very careful. I mean, this is only the beginning, earliest, early stages of the bill. Um, let's not jump to hasty conclusions. Um, I want to find out that who the author is of AB or SB 742 and find out uh, who the author is. We have a lot of um, things to look at. Hopefully that they address people with disabilities. A lot of people with disabilities are afraid of dogs and that particularly if it's a dog that they don't know and that that includes myself. I've come to like dogs over the years. Once again, if it's a dog I know, I will, I will pet it. If it's a dog that I don't know, I will <clears throat> shy away from it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And just one uh, more point, uh, Mayor, before we move on. We're going to bring it back to council um, next meeting, not to support it, but to, you know, vote on it. Just want to be clear. Very good. Okay, next item, please. Next item is city manager item. All right, well, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of City Council, Ashley Feeney, your City Manager, here with a few updates. Uh, one thing that I wanted to make sure to get the word out, uh, our Economic Development and Community Engagement team is gonna be hosting a community grant, uh, community projects grant information section next week. Uh, there has been quite a bit of interest uh, in the grants. Um, and one of the things we wanted to do is provide an opportunity to have members of the public that might have some questions uh, have our team be available for some Q&A. So that's next Wednesday, March 29th from 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, here at the City Council Chambers. There's also a Zoom option available. And just a reminder, if you've got an idea out there, applications are due uh, Friday, April 14th by 4 p.m. So please get those in. It's an exciting opportunity that the uh, council made available for the community. Uh, some more good news on the grant front. Uh, our uh, General Services Department was successful in pursuit of yet another grant uh, for the Highway Safety Improvement Program. This is Cycle 11 grant, and the approved project was a grant award of almost $1.7 million. Uh, it includes uh, systemic intersection improvements at 36 different uh, intersections throughout the city. And there's also a specific uh, multimodal safety improvements at the intersection of Roseville Road and Butternut Drive. So kudos to the team on uh, bringing the bacon home for citrus sites here. So. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, Walnut Hills. Uh, Vice Mayor Daniel spoke to this earlier, uh, but wanting to uh, get the word out about uh, American Legion Post 637 of Citrus Heights as hosting the Walnut Hills. Uh, part of that funding, a significant part of that funding came from a grant, uh, arts and history grant that the uh, city council approved uh, based upon a request that we received, starts Wednesday, March 29th at 7 p.m. That's an opening ceremony. Uh, there will be re reading of names on the 30th, 31st, and on the 1st, all starting at 7.15. Uh, the citrus, my understanding is uh, probably the citrus height-centric focus will be on the opening ceremony on March 29th, and then the remainder of the evenings will be split up across the rest of the uh, Sacramento County area on the, on the reading of names. Um, so, so if we were going to go, you recommend we go with the opening ceremony? I think go uh, opening ceremony would be certainly uh, a great uh, one to attend. There will be Citrus Heights names. I understand uh, at this time that that's when Citrus Heights names would likely be read. Um, and then, of course, uh, honoring the rest of the names would be the following one, evenings. Uh, one, one second, though. just want to remind Council that these are non-agendized items. So just... Well, we, we're allowed to speak to things you know, that aren't on the agenda. We're just not allowed to speak to things that are gonna take some sort of action. So, I mean, we, we can talk about something. Mm -hmm. um, okay. 
I just wanted to bring up that, uh, um, I wanted to make sure people understood also that this is going to be available for 24 hours a day. Absolutely. Um, if if um, 6 p.m. works for you to come out and look at the wall, great. If 2 o'clock in the morning works for you, uh, that's great. You know, so I just want to make sure people understand that you can come where's out it at the Where's it at in the park? You it'll can't be, miss it. It's big. It? <laughs> it, it, it'll be in the kind of that lower bowl area where oftentimes they have car shows and things of that nature um, near the pavilion. Uh, so just on the other side of the pool. But it is, uh, as Vice Mayor Daniels pointed out, open 24 hours. So um, whenever you want to uh, go to pay your respects or experience the wall, uh, you have 24-hour period to do so. Um, these times that are listed here are when there's going to be kind of more formal activities, uh, the opening ceremony, the reading of names. There's also a uh, reception and speaker that you, a speaker opportunity that you can learn about uh, at the link here for wallthehillcitrusheights.com if you'd like to learn more information, and then the closing ceremonies on Sunday, April 2nd. But it, it's a good opportunity for the city to uh, experience um, it's a three-quarter replica of the wall, so wanted to make sure that the community knows about that. Great. That concludes my updates. Great. All right, next item, please. Next item is items requested by council members or any future agenda items. Anything? Yes. Um, yesterday, I believe it was yesterday, uh, my days are a little foggy right now, but... Um, <laughs> Yesterday, I think it was that um, we heard of once again a, a shooting at a, uh, at a high school. Um, and I think the speaker earlier tonight mentioned about something about 150 shootings over a certain time period. It doesn't even include uh, other uh, acts and, and that, that uh, uh, of violence and whatnot. Um, so I'm coming back tonight to see if I can uh, get another council member to agree with me to bring back a, uh, a, an agenda item to examine funding and staffing for school resource officers in our two high schools, San Juan High School and Mesa Verde High School. Um, I, I'll leave it at that for now. Any support for that? Oh, I'll, I'll second that, that we bring that uh, item back for our discussion again. But this time it's we're scaled back to just two, yeah. not the whole district. Can I get clarity on that? So it is for two officers. Is that what? One officer in each high school. One officer at each two high school. school. Two, okay. two, two total. Okay. All right. Next item, please. Next item is we have a closed session item, a conference with real property negotiators. So at this time, we will adjourn to closed session. Great. I'll call it adjourned. Thanks, everyone, for coming.